Welcome, bet riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. Well, I am super happy to have you all with us uh, for today's Laid Back Bike Report. Let me tell you what we've got coming up for you today. Hansa Gala, our news reporter, will be with us with his recumbent news of the month. And we're going to uh, head out to uh, California where we're going to find Al and Alice Krauss. They are the co-directors of the Battle Mountain Event uh, World Human Powered Speed Challenge, where Trey and I are heading in about a week. So... Very excited to hear from them all about what's coming up in that event and what their expectations are. Then our old pal John Hodkin is with us. So uh, Inner Tuba, you might remember that uh, that title for his uh, organization. He is planning on a uh, trip to the USA again in 2023 uh, up the Mississippi River. And we're going to talk uh, with him and hear all about that and his fundraising and what he's up to uh, with his um, his house concerts as well. So lots going on with John. Then we have Heiko Truppel from Germany. Heiko is the marketing director for HP Velotechnik, and they have a new e-assisted bike called the, well, it's, an, it's not a new bike, but they have an e-assisted version of their speed machine bike. And he's going to talk all about that. And then Larry Seidman took the initiative to do an interview with a very interesting uh, gentleman. Paul Kilgore uh, will be with us. And Larry's going to talk to him about the uh, Crested Butte mountain biking event. And uh, these folks riding in this event were all... Um, people, many of them were from the Paralyzed Veterans of America. And uh, and a really interesting event, lots of great uh, video there. Uh, Larry did a great job in that interview, so we look forward to seeing that. All right, let's meet our crew, a bit of a skeleton crew today. We have uh, our director with us from Colorado Springs. It is Larry Seidman. Hi, Larry. Hi, Gary. And also uh, doing the uh, media, uh, hitting the banners, popping up those slides when we need them. It's Trey Burgoyne down in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, Trey, how you doing? Um, awesome. How are y'all? All right. Well, I, I can hear them all saying they're doing great as well. So thanks, guys. Appreciate your help being with us today. Uh, let me tell you how you can uh, join in with the live chat today uh, and participate in the Layback Bike Report. Uh, Facebook, you can just uh, comment in the Facebook uh, video that you see there. And on YouTube, uh, the live chat is available usually just to the side of the video you're watching, maybe below if you're on mobile. Uh, so yeah, let us know if you have questions, comments uh, for uh, any of our guests. And uh, also please let us know where you are watching from today. We'd love to hear that. Now, how can you support the Laid Back Bike Report? Well, you can like us on Facebook. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. And you can click that little white eye right up there. That will take you to our website, laidbackbikereport.com. And there you can learn all about our past shows, what's coming up. Buy one of our Laid Back Bike Report hats that you see up there. Uh, all kinds of great information uh, uh, about us. So, uh feel free to jump onto our website. All right, let me tell you about our sponsors. First of all, we have TerraCycle, makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent, and Trailside Trikes, a fine recumbent trike shop on the Withlacoochee Trail in Florida and also now in Knoxville, Tennessee, and TerraTrike Greenspeed, the best in leisure, performance, adventure touring, electric, and portability. Wherever your adventure leads, TerraTrike will take you there. And Greenspeed, where Ian Sims designs, bring performance through science and engineering. And 
Laid Back Cycles, the top USA dealer for TerraTrike and the premier source for Cat Trike, Ice, and Green Speed. We give you the freedom to ride and Connecticut Yankee Peddler. We feature multiple brands of trikes, including electric assist models. Test rides and Southern Iowa hospitality are always available at our mega store in Cheriton and Avenue Trikes. With the gearing you need and the comfort you want, it's time to enjoy riding again. They're in stock, ready to ship, and only $19.95. Dealer inquiries are welcome. And Azub. This company is a three-time winner of the Trike of the Year Award and has brought several unique technological solutions to the world of recumbent bikes, including the titanium front suspension on the TIE Fly Trike. Combined with tuned rear suspension, it provides its owner with absolute comfort throughout the ride. And Recumbent PDX. With a 150 trike inventory, Recumbent PDX is the West Coast's only cat trike megastore. We have over 20 trikes on our showroom floor just waiting for you to test ride through our beautiful Portland neighborhood. Call or email to schedule your ride today. And EcoCycles, leaders in electric assist and customer support with a line of specialized conversion kits to retrofit just about any bent model out there. Check them out at EcoCycles. Check out EcoCycles at cycles.eco right now. All right, let's get on with the show, folks. Uh, we're going to kick it off with uh, Hansa's news report. So Hansa, take it away. Hi guys, Honza from Recumbent.news here once again. August was a sad month for the recumbent community and for the whole bicycle industry, I would say, because we have lost Mike Burrows, uh, a genius bicycle designer and recumbent designer from UK. Uh, you may know him as the designer of the Lotus 108 uh, full carbon fiber bike that won the Olympic race, the 4000 meters race at the 1992 Olympic Games in Barcelona. Uh, he also designed the giant TCR uh, bike frame or gave it the direction in the uh, 1990s. Uh, he designed a uh, giant halfway folding bike, uh, eight freight uh, cargo bike. And his main passion and basically also the, the, the main idea that stood behind the Lotus 108 came from recumbents. Recumbent bikes uh, and velomobiles were his uh, main passion. He was racing till his uh, 70s. Uh, he designed the Winchita trike and Red Racer bike. His unique design with, uh, with um, single side wheel and eccentric uh, position of the wheel and uh, offset uh, cassette and wheel were very unique and uh, we simply lost uh, a recumbent advocate and a uh, very good person. So you uh, can read more about him on uh, uh, in a special article I have on uh, recumbent.news magazine and yeah that's it uh, the second news from uh, august is that has the bikes uh, introduce the new seat for uh, or mesh for their uh, trikes and also has a pino seat uh, it's called vario comfort it is great looking uh, seat a recumbent seat and it has even some adjustability so you can add uh, some layers uh, of padding into different places of the seat itself 
So this is again very unique, uh, uh, very interesting innovation from from Hase bikes from Germany. And enjoy the rest of the laid back bike report and see you next month. Bye. Thank you, Hansa. Uh, yeah, Mike Burroughs, a tragic loss uh, to the recumbent world, the biking world as as a whole. I was very privileged to have met Mike in uh, in the UK in 2018 when I was there for the World Championships. And he was very generous with his time, sat down with me literally on a slag heap, which the course was built on there. And we had a chance to talk for about 20 minutes. And uh, wow, 20 minutes with Mike Burroughs is uh, an incredible uh, uh, chance to learn so much about uh, bike history and, and development, which he was a huge part of. So we will miss you, Mike Burroughs. Uh, uh, like Kanza said, he has a piece in recumbent.news about Mike. And, uh, and I have that interview with him uh, from 2018 as well, if you'd like to learn more about who Mike Burroughs was. Uh, and uh, that will be in the description below the link to that uh, video. So, all right, folks, let's uh, move along to our uh, main uh, segment here today. Uh, as uh, most of you know, because we've been talking about it incessantly for the last couple of months, Trey and I are heading out to uh, Battle Mountain, Nevada uh, next weekend, actually now, to cover the World Human Powered Speed Challenge. Uh, we've had uh, a builder, a couple of the builders on last month talking about uh, their particular vehicle that they're bringing to Battle Mountain and how it was designed and built. And today we have the chance to talk to the co-directors of the uh, event who have been running this show for uh, quite a number of years, Al and Alice Krauss. They are out in California. Uh, and I think you're really going to enjoy learning more about Battle Mountain in preparation for the video that we will be creating when we're out there. So uh, I think at this point, we'll just jump into the video, Larry. Let's have a look. All right, guys, we are here with Al and Alice Krauss uh, representing the Battle Mountain World Human Powered Speed Challenge. And uh, they have been doing so for a while. And I'm really anxious to have a chance to sit down with them now and talk all about this great event. So, uh, Al and Alice, welcome to the Laid Back Back Report. Hey, thanks so much. We totally appreciate you having us. Yeah, this is fun. Great. All right. First of all, let's introduce you properly to our audience. If you would, can you tell us uh, your what, what it is you do at uh, Battle Mountain? We herd the cats. <laughs> We're cat herders professionally. No, uh, um, we are co-directors, although she does most of the directing. If it's written or you have to sign it, she did that part. And, and I mainly talk on the telephone. Yeah, we, we take turns with the jobs, but we're the event organizers, I guess would be our official title. And then we also are, um, he's the president of the International Human Powered Vehicle Association, and I'm the treasurer. So we also work directly with the board of the IHPVA about uh, the um, rules for the competition and make sure that those are followed so that the world records that are set are, are legit. Right. I know that's a really important part and something you guys work really hard on. All right. Well, let's let's start out, if we could, by defining what we're talking about here. Describe, if you would, to us what Battle Mountain and the World Human Powered Speed Challenge is. I'm going to talk. Well, talk. it's, it's a, <laughs> a competition of the uh, world's fastest bicycles. It's uh, human powered vehicles where there are no design rules, really. And uh, um, it's the optimum location for the, the 200 meter record. And uh, we do our best to make sure everyone gets a good shot at setting a record there in whatever category they're in. All right, well, let's go ahead and, and start by describing, you said it was a great location. Let's describe the course. What's that like? It's on Highway 305, which is outside of Battle Mountain, Nevada heading south toward Austin. And uh, it's at, uh, we wrote this down, 4,619 feet in altitude. And it was found by one of our members of the IHPVA years ago, Matt Weaver, who um, was looking for a place that we could do this um, 200 meter uh, biking event. And he drove all around the Western United States with an altimeter and his computer laptop on his seat next to him and 
just downloaded data, um, length of roads, uh, altitude, um, took some wind measurements, and then went back home and crunched all the data. And this was the spot. And it just so happens that it's right next to Battle Mountain, which is just a great name for our sport. And also, they're a really friendly town, and they, they welcome us, and we get to be there, and we consider them family. Nice. Very nice. All right. So uh, there are different sorts of bikes that race there and they can be sorted into categories as well. Can you give us an idea about the categories of racers there? Well, it, uh, it will start with the open class and it's divided by men and women. And uh, there's no restriction on that. Those are typically two wheeled vehicles. And uh, uh, we also make a distinction for uh, multiple riders multi-track and and uh you'll see three and four wheel vehicles there also arm power and and juniors uh there's several categories of juniors and it's any combination of those two you can have a arm powered junior tandem and uh we'll recognize it. okay and just as an aside uh it was something that really grabbed my attention a couple of years back uh multiple riders on a vehicle you've had one that was a lot of riders. So what was that bullet shaped thing that uh, you guys had? That was the Sprocket Rocket. They, they were great. They were fun. It is an amazing vehicle, and uh, um, they they did everything they could to make it, it would just go one speed pretty much. Um, uh, well, they pushed as hard as they could, but it was. They tried every different technique yeah. to try and make it go faster down the course, sprinting early, sprinting late, and and it pretty much. Uh, had one performance and <laughs> they got over 55. They did great. They and all earned a 55 mile an hour hat and the, the, the crew was great. And the logistics of handling a vehicle that size on the course, they had worked out really well. They had a special trailer and the whole crew knew absolutely what they were doing and they were all drilled and uh, they were a great team and, and we look forward to them coming back at some point. Let's talk about the, uh, the, the, the sorts of people that actually come uh, and groups that come to Battle Mountain. What sorts do you get? Uh, it's a pretty broad cross-section actually. And um, there's lots of great representation from the universities. Uh, um, and they, they typically bring uh, student riders. So these aren't necessarily always pro-level. Um, sometimes they do recruit pro-level riders and this year, uh, um, French team is bringing Francois Purvis, who I believe is a record holder in several of the UCI categories. Um, so that's going to be very exciting to see his performance. And then uh, your your home builder, writer, owner, person, um, maybe they're a strong amateur. So uh, all kinds of levels of fitness and um, and really, it's all about efficiency. So, you know, you don't have to be a world-class athlete to go pretty darn fast. Right. Well, and that goes right into my next question, which is speed. I mean, that's right in the name of the event. So uh, perhaps people who are not familiar with what goes on at uh, this event at Battle Mountain, uh, maybe they would be surprised to know how fast these bikes are actually going. What sorts of uh, speeds can be attained at this event? Well, the, the top speed right now is the men's world record, and it's held by Todd Reichert of Toronto, Canada, and it is 89.59. And if he had had one more day to run, we, he'd set that on the last day. Um, he probably would have hit 90. Um, every day he went out, he, he increased his speed. So that was uh, pretty amazing to watch. That that week was was an amazing week, and Todd um, broke that record every time he rode the bike that year. Um, and then the women's record stands uh, at seventy eight point sixty one, and that's held by Ilona Peltier at France. And uh, that battle was, or is it Italy? She's from Manitou. She's France. from France, yes. Because yeah. I confused because the girls from. Italy and France that year traded the record back and forth every night. And it was quite a battle. It was, it was fun to watch that one. Um, the, the tandem record is at 74, 73, and that's held by Calvin Mose and, and uh, Evan Benavides who are from Toronto. And they're, the Toronto team has brought out some really amazing records over the last few years. They came out um, 
what, probably 10 years ago as a fledgling team. And uh, all of the, the design that they had were based on their um, racing with the um, ASME, bike. ASME bike, which are, they have definite design category that they have to, to build to. And so they brought their original bike, which was kind of a potato, and they put every student they had in it and ran them down the course. And then they brought it a faster bike. And then every year they made improvements. Um, some of the kids graduated out. Um, some of them are still there going to grad school. Uh, the Aero Velo team of Todd Reichert and. Uh, oh, you're doing it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they came from the Toronto team. They are they are graduate students from the Toronto team. So that team just has has been really amazing to watch. Um, Absolutely. And Todd, uh, Todd has been on the show. He was a wonderful guest and we learned quite a bit, a lot about what the uh, Toronto yeah, right. team uh, put together. So, well, you know, one of the other speeds that I'd like to mention, though, that was a really big deal that didn't really get the attention that I thought it should because it was a woman's record was the arm powered record that was broken um, in 2019, I believe. Or was it 2018? I'd have to look it up. But anyway, um, Karen Dark. Karen Dark came out as an arm powered uh, athlete. And uh, the standing record at the time for out arm powered was um, 24.85 that had been set the year previously by Sarah Piercy. And Karen Dark came out and she slaughtered that record. She, she took it up to 46.54. First time she went out, she, she bumped it up 20 miles an hour. And every time she went out, she broke that record again. So a 20 mile an hour increase over the standing record was amazing. It was huge. It was huge. And, and she, she just did it so easily. It was just beautiful to watch. It was, um, and I don't think she got enough attention for it. I'd like to give her more of a shout out. Um, I think she really, really deserved way more world attention. You mentioned earlier about this, this uh, 55 mile an hour hat. What is the deal with the hats? Oh, you want to see a hat? I can get one. She's yeah, gonna no, that would be awesome. And uh, yeah, get the hat and so, then explain what those are. Well, they're pretty much racing for hats. Um, we do award some trophies and they uh, um, pretty much though, the hats are the thing. You, you For each mile an hour, five mile an hour increment starting at 50, you get a new hat and it's a different color. So this is a 50 mile an hour hat. It's brown and uh, that's the lowest speed that you can go to earn a hat. And um, we get juniors, uh, beginners, trikes, uh, arm power vehicles, some of the lower speed vehicles. Getting this hat is a big deal because sometimes getting over 50 is really hard for some vehicles. So that's your first hat. And then of course, everybody, the, the goal for years was 80 hit 80. You know, we couldn't get anybody to hit 80 for years and years. And so this, when people finally started hitting 80, we thought that was worth flames. So your 80 mile an hour hat has flames. And the first one of these was awarded to Sam Whittingham. And uh, he's kind of a low key Canadian. And so he said, you know, if I ever go 85, I don't think I want anything that's really that flashy. You know, it kind of attracts a lot of attention. So when he hit 85, he got this kind of boring hat, but he That's a it. plain Jane hat for but sure. It's, it's, kind of. it, but when Todd won it, I, I made the comment that it matched his wife's hair. So <laughs> <laughs> it actually worked out really well. We have yet to give out a 90 mile an hour hat, um, but we're having them made because that's the next, that's the next goal. Is so if someone hits 90 miles an hour, when I'm out there uh, next month, you will, you'll be prepared with a hat? We are having hats made right now. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. All yeah. right. Yeah. Good. So the hats are, and you will see, you know, everybody walking around with their hat on. They're, they're wearing they're, them proudly. Yeah. And some of them are getting pretty tattered looking. I'm thinking that they might need to be replaced eventually, but uh, they're, right. they're hanging on there. So just yeah. to disabuse any of our viewers who think that these people are racing for the big bucks, uh, are there any... <laughs> Are there any monetary prizes attached to any of these trophies? In the past, we have given minimal prizes, like, you know, two or three hundred dollars, that, that kind of thing. Um, but our budget's gotten pretty tight these last few years. And so in 2019, the board made the decision that we would um, suspend 
the actual prize money um, because we we couldn't afford it any longer. We we break even for the most part with the with our uh, little bit of sponsorships we get and our entry fees, and we were having to dip into our funds every year for prize money. And and it's getting to the point with the IHPVA that 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 was kind of putting us in a tenuous position financially. So we made the decision not to to do prize money um, and unless we pick up another big sponsor, which would be great. I'd love to to be able to reinstitute. Well, let's uh, let's just for a moment stop and and talk about that. If there was someone who had uh, some funds that they just didn't know what to do with and really like what you guys are doing out there and the whole notion of of trying to be the fastest human powered vehicle in the world, how could they help? Well, uh, monetary donations. Um, we are a 501c3 and we can give a, a tax deductible receipt for any donations that we receive. And uh, we would put that into the, the budget and then we utilize it for whatever we need for each year. This year we're buying new radios, which has been a real issue. And uh, they're expensive. We have to get the good radios that will cover the entire course, which is over six miles. And uh, we pay flaggers to run our, our closed course. We have to run it like road construction. We can only open and close the course for 20 minutes at a time. So um, we pay them a good wage because they keep us all safe and uh, they are absolutely required for our permit to be out there. And so, you know, if we had extra money in the budget, it goes to prize money. Um, that's kind of where we've always put it. Alice, how, how could this person wanting to make this donation get a hold of you? Contact information is on the um, IHPVA website and they can call or our phone number and our email address are there. And, uh, or they can send a Facebook message um, at our, either our IHPVA website, Facebook page or the World Human Power Speed Challenge page, and uh, any way they'd like. Um, we're pretty easy to get a hold of. <laughs> Good, and we will have those. We will have those uh, links yeah. in the description below the video here. Guys, could you at this point uh, share with our audience maybe a couple of three highlights from your years at Battle Mountain? What uh, what impressed you over the years? Started in two thousand with a group of enthusiasts that, that borrowed our timing equipment and they had a, a few bikes that came out. And then uh, through 2001 and two, um, they developed the systems that we still use today and the core of volunteers and the people that, that, that do what they do. But in 2003, the original organizer said, it was kind of last minute. He said, I, we can't do it. I have to cancel. And everybody was so uh just de devastated. They were planning on going. People were planning on, on, you know, following it. We were all avidly following. And a bunch of us said, we can come. And, and there was this huge response and uh, probably at least 10 or 12 of us came for the first time. And we kind of put our heads together with George and Carol Re Leone and said, can you kind of run it and we'll come and do whatever. And they said, yeah. And other people kind of put their hands up and we all showed up that year and started, you know, doing what we do, and then um, developed more systems that that Carol was really good at putting together the the paperwork that we follow because um, a lot of it was just, you know, you told the next person that was running it how you did it, <laughs> but it wasn't ever put down on paper. Carol did that, and uh, it it has become. Uh, you know, gradually streamlined as far as all of the things that we, how we do what we do to make it work. And, um, but it really 2003 was kind of the, the beginning of it growing to what it is now. Um, so that was pretty in, important. Uh, one of the big things that Al was always a big proponent for was turning it into an open. So, it was an invitational before, and I felt that was limiting. And and it was the best place in the world, and everyone should have a crack at it. Um, so we turned it into an open, and there was a little bit of controversy with some of the uh, existing riders. They didn't want to qualify, but I I eventually convinced them, and then we moved the qualifying out to 305, and uh, and then that led to the shortest course runs and and. Um, an event group, and, and it responded. And uh, 
Now tell us what that means. So um, so that means that an entrant, somebody who comes there, doesn't automatically get to to race, right? They have to qualify. Is that how that goes? Tell me about qualifying. The the qualifying serves two functions. Is that it's a um, it, it's a physical demonstration of your bike's stability. We want to see your your bike go in a more controlled lower speed situation and stop, and that you have control of it. And also to get an idea of about how fast you go so we can integrate you with the rest of the riders. Um, because our time on the road is limited, we can only run a few bikes at a time. And it's best to know about how fast everyone's going to go so you don't have overtaking on the course and other complications. So everybody qualifies and then they get moved into a group. There's a minimum speed requirement. The whole process is kind of, it's difficult to describe. Um, once you see it happening, uh, you pretty well get the idea, but um, it's as fair as we could make it and integrate all of the, the different categories, men's and women together um, based on speed and merit. So uh, it took a while to develop that too. That system came later. Um, it's a work in progress, the whole thing. And uh, uh, as the guys go faster, as the people go faster, we have to manage it. Why is the time on the road limited for you guys? That's part of our permit. Uh, Nevada <laughs> Department of Transportation will not allow us to have the road closed more than 20 minutes at a time. We've lobbied them a, a number of different ways um, from being sweet to to being, you know, kind of even semi-demanding. And they say they're they're pretty adamant about, nope, that's it, 20 minutes, that's all, um, unless there's an emergency, like if we have a bike that's down on the course, then, you know, they'll, they'll allow for us to have the time to get that bike cleared of the course before we open it for traffic again, but... Uh, it's an open highway, and it's actually fairly it's, busy. It's a busy highway. <laughs> we have people backed up waiting at the roadblock um, to get to town or to, to get to work or get to school. Um, we actually delay the morning start to, until the school bus passes. That's part of the, the 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 thing that we learned how to work around because we would get complaints that the school bus was sitting at the roadblock. And so it's like, okay, well, when are you coming? And they told us, and we just don't start till after the school bus goes by. So you um, guys line up as many people as you can. As the road opens, you let, uh, I'm sorry, as the road closes, you send off the, the riders as quickly as every, how often do you send them off? Uh, every five mile minutes. rate, you, you don't wait for, for them to complete it. There's only two minutes between launches typically, and uh, um, four bikes in a heat. Uh, it's all very scheduled, yeah. and and uh, the riders need to know when they're going to ride as well for their nutrition and their warm up. And often these bikes have a lengthy um, procedure for the rider to get in and the the the, the bike to be sealed up. Um, so. We try and let everyone know pretty much, you know, within a few minutes of, of when they're going to run. And and uh, and sometimes they're still late to the starting line. <laughs> you got a problem then. So they run and then you have to open the road. They open the road. And then what you just allow the traffic that is built up through and then close it again. Is that yes. how it works? OK, so it's yeah. not a timing. It's not like it has to be open so many minutes. You let the no. traffic through, no, you let the pulse close it traffic. down, and now you got another 20 minutes kind of thing. Right. And then okay. we have we, we have a what we call a sweep car that's generally driven by our friend Dave Larrington, who comes all the way from London. Or, or and, Paul Gracie. And, re and rents the fastest car he can. And then he goes up the road after all the other cars have left to make sure nobody's pulled over on the side of the road and is sitting there because – we need to make sure that there are no vehicles anywhere on the course. So we send the sweep car up, they get to the top of the, of the, the course and he radios back and says, it's clear. Then the teams can start getting out on the road and start staging. So our 20 minutes is probably at least 10 of it is involved in just making sure the road is clear and the teams are setting up. So we really only have about 10 minutes to send the bikes down the road. And each one has, a vehicle following it to make sure if they have any mechanical difficulties or crash that they can get them off the road because there's another bike and another car right on their tail. 
So that's why the speed sorting is important because you don't want to have a slow bike in front of a fast bike and get overtaken. Sure. Um, so the qualifying helps us sort speeds. And as the week goes by, speeds go up um, and people get moved around accordingly. Um, so there's a certain amount of, of positioning that we have to make sure is accurate enough. Um, and we've been surprised. I mean, we've had three bikes in catch at the same time that we all had to scramble to make sure we got, caught them all. Um, <laughs> and it's, it gets to be kind of a rocking and rolling thing down there. Um, and it's... Yeah, if one bike throws a chain or, or has even a minor technical problem, another bike can catch it. And uh, um, then you'll have a situation where maybe there's two bikes in the timing traps at the same time and the timers have to sort things out. But uh, And it's not as though these streamliners have great visibility around them as to what's going on because they can pretty much only most of them see through a monitor of what's in front of them. Is that very, very limited field of view and it's out the front. So if somebody's behind you, you don't have any idea. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. and now some of the, the some of the, the bikes have a radio inside of them that they can communicate with their chase vehicle. Um, but in the past, um, up until fairly recently, that wasn't even something that they had had been able to do. Um, the carbon fiber of the bikes kind of in, interferes with the radio um, transmissions. So the, some of the vehicles do have communication, but most of them don't. So you just have to kind of watch your bike and see what it's doing. And and we have a way that we teach them how to signal if there's a problem. They'll go over into the other lane so that they, their chase vehicle knows something's going on. Like maybe they dropped a chain or, or something's happening in the bike that the chase vehicle can't see. But it's a lot of it is intuition. You know, you know your bike, you know your rider. You can tell if they're on, tr on track. Um, so it's it's that part of the the event itself is probably the most nerve wracking um, having cars and bikes on the road at the same time. So right. we, we really have to watch. It's all about safety. And, yeah. and that's really our primary concern out there is that, that we make it as safe as possible, eliminate as, as many natural hazards as possible. And, and hopefully everyone does the right thing when they're on the ground. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned safety because, uh, as you say, it's I know that's a huge part of what you do, and it needs you need some help with that. You also, Alice, you mentioned Dave Larrington being in the chase car, so uh, maybe our audience could be forgiven for thinking that this is just a two man show. But I think there are <laughs> no. some more people involved that you may wish to acknowledge. Uh, so if you, yeah, so if you could tell us about what jobs there are. Uh, there at Battle Mountain to to, to, um, to run this. And uh, tell us about some of the people that you have working with you besides uh, Dave, who's with you. Well, prior to the event, we worked directly with Paula Tumera at Lander County Convention and Tourism. And she's our person in town. And she helps us do all the things that we, we can't do physically because we're not there. And she has all the contacts with all of the different uh, businesses and, and state entities. And so she is our person uh, that helps us in the pre-planning of the event. And uh, when we get there, her husband, Paul, owns a ranch and he has a great big truck and a great big trailer. And he helps us haul all of the, the safety stuff, which involves about 125 uh, bales of straw and about an equal number of pieces of plywood. And uh, we have to put all of that out on the course and uh, it's a chore. And so we generally will get teams with young, strong backs to come help toss bales and, and, and do the job. So if you'd like to help with that, yes. there's openings available there. Saturday morning. <laughs> We will need Perhaps you don't know me that well. Um, <laughs> I, I was planning on coming. You know, I am bringing Trey Burgoyne with me uh, to help me with uh, to help me with uh, doing some of the videoing. And I think we're going to fly a drone. Trey, uh, Trey probably would be happy to move some bales of hay. I will check with him before the show tomorrow. Okay, and before you volunteer. You know him. So. All right. So <laughs> what other sorts of, so you have officials, well, uh, you have timers, what, what other yes, sorts of jobs? And, and our, you know, and I got to give a shout out to our flaggers, the, the people that keep us out there on the road, they have to take the, the NDOT uh, flagging course online and get certified at the pass a test. And, um, our lead flagger, Jerry Ann Tout, has been out there with us since. She's been out there for 
10 years? 15, 15 I think. Years. Yeah, a long she, time, she, forever. she came and saved our, she and her friends came and saved our bacon the first year that NDOT said we had to provide our own flaggers because prior to that, they used to come out and do it themselves. And so she gets, she finds people to come out and do the job, get some train. They all go out every morning before we even get there. They're out there at five o'clock in the morning getting the course ready um, and getting ready for, to run the roadblocks. And those guys, without them, we couldn't do the event. And then starting at the top, we've got the starter. Arnold. Yeah, Arnold. And uh, he gets all the bikes lined up, ready to go, yells at them if they need it, um, uh, makes sure that they're all ready, uh, keeps the, the chase vehicles ready. And uh, he, he runs the show at the start. And uh, typically, as an assistant, we're not sure who that is this year. That might be one of those position that, positions that's available. Um, we can talk to Arnold. There's more discussion on the Facebook group. So Ar Arnold and his wife, Marika, they travel all the way from the Netherlands to do this. Um, they love this punishment and they come every year to help us. And without us, we would, without them, we'd probably be pretty lost. Um, they they came, the first year they came, they just stepped into the, some pretty important uh, roles and, and they like doing it and we love them. They're doing it. We depend on them. We don't, we don't have to think about managing them in any way they do the job then our timers we wouldn't be able to do the job without them so they also are very important uh jen nagami is is our lead timer and typically um danny i can't remember your last name right now <laughs> <laughs> you read it all the time <laughs> and, and danny's there running the wind machine marika is often there to watch them to make sure they're in line and she heads up the communication at the timing area she's great on the radio she's in the middle of the course uh it's a uh, pretty critical position, and we, again, we would be lost without our volunteers. They come to catch. Al and I are in catch because we can manage the course best from the catch end. Uh, and uh, when the bikes come in, uh, obviously the riders can't put their feet down, uh, so we have to to physically catch them. And uh, the the teams also bring catch people. And so we, we work with them to make sure that they catch the bikes, get the, the rider out of the bike and get them off the road quickly so that the next bike that comes in isn't, isn't going to be right behind them. And uh, catch can be pretty fun, uh, interesting and uh, very busy hair raising at times. So um, we do most of the up and down the course communications from there. Um, and if there's any issues, uh, they come to Al who's the, the course control, and he makes sure that any any traffic that needs to go up to the top of the, the event then gets radioed through. Um, our friend Mike Silva comes all the way from Grenada, um, and his official job, he says, is to supervise the supervisors, which is he pals around with us and makes sure that we don't forget stuff because we get tired, and he's kind of our third brain. And uh, often he's the only brain, so it's good to have him. He shows up every year to make sure that we know what we're doing. Um, we also have a number of people that, that are what we call chase riding officials. They get in the vehicle with the team, and it's their job just to run the radio. Because in the past, we, we gave the radio to the teams and said, okay, if there's a problem, you need to, to let us know. But in the midst of the crisis that they're handling, often the radio transmissions would be forgotten. And we they'd come into catch and we'd say, what happened? Where's your radio? Where's your <laughs> <laughs> and then they would look around in their car and find that they'd been sitting on it. So we decided a few years back that it'd be best to have one of our officials in the car. And that's their only job is to talk on the radio or not talk on the radio if there's not anything going on. And, uh, our friends, uh, uh, Larry Lim, who's one of our writer builders, um, brother, brother and sister showed up one year, just Frank. To Frank and Joyce, and they jumped into that that role and they love doing the chase official. Um, and so they've become our go-to for that. They're not officially in charge of that, although they're in charge of that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, and then we already mentioned uh, Dave Larrington that runs Sweep. And uh, then we also have uh, Robert Barnett, who comes all the way from Oklahoma. And uh, he uh, officiates the drag races, which is one of the kind of fun things we do on the side of this event that isn't an official of, uh, on 305 event. It's, it's in town. And he actually built uh, a timing tree for drags. And... 
Well, we've never been there, actually. Uh, that's, we our, died. <laughs> <laughs> that's our time off. But um, he's got a pretty neat little, I think it's an eighth mile system and uh, yeah. um, hands you an actual timing tape of, of your performance. So. Yeah. And in years past, he even awards his own prize money out of his own pocket. They've timed dogs and they've done it on foot as well. Yes. So. <laughs> I think the dog was pretty famous. Dog one. <laughs> Um, also, we shout out to our sponsors, the mines, the local mines actually do uh, help us monetarily, um, depending on the year. Um, it, it, it's not a set amount. We have to send in a, an application every year and then they send us some money to help us with the uh, overhead. And uh, the, the mines names have changed um, uh, over the past years. It's Nevada Gold Mines is the main one now, but it previously had been Newmont Mines and uh, Silver Standard. Uh, mines and they they often um, will bring out swag to um, to give to the the riders um, just little freebies and things actual gold nuggets perhaps yeah, uh, you yeah. you'd get you'd get better response I think if they did but uh, yeah right we'll and, work on that and and then the ambulance service we we um, a lot of the universities uh, have a requirement that their riders can't be on the road unless there is an EMT present. So uh, the local ambulance service sends out an ambulance um, for every session, which is morning and evening. And they, they park and they, they, you know, they just watch the races. We've only actually ever had to call them once. Um, and that wasn't for an injury even. It was just somebody had passed out. So um, it, but they come every every session. They they watch the races, and we hope we never have to use their services. But we're really glad that they can be there. So. I know that you guys are very concerned about safety, and you actually you don't have a lot of rules, but you do have some rules around what the vehicles need to have for safety. The British call this like scrutineering, right? I mean, what <laughs> what uh, what do you have to you have to pass? Uh, the test to make sure that you are safe. What what is the process at Battle Mountain for that? Well, it's it's kind of almost the opposite of that. We look for things that are dangerous, and we make sure that your bike doesn't have those dangerous things. Um, and then there's been some evolution too because of situations that have occurred. People are going a lot faster now, um, so we want uh, there to be uh, something the equivalent of a roll hoop, uh, our hard point in case your bike rolls over and also some seat belts to make sure you don't come out of the bike if it rolls over. Cause that's happened. Because people, it's happened. People have come out, they get some pretty good road rash. Um, also the a helmet, they have to have a, re, a, a improved helmet. Um, and then the, the, the tech inspection is what we call that. Um, they just look your bike over and make sure there are no open ends on your tubes, something that could cut you. Uh, nothing that's inherently dangerous. And um, we've been to a few events where things were, somebody that had a chain running right next to their head and they just basically put duct tape over their ear. Um, <laughs> that should be <laughs> sufficient, shouldn't it? We, we, we try not to influence design. <laughs> right. So you made them put two layers of duct tape to make right. sure that they well, were we safe. were running that, that event. That was one of our first events. And <laughs> It's come a long way since then. <laughs> and who does who does those inspections? Uh, generally, it's uh, Arnold and, uh, and Hans. Hans von Vucht. And um, it sort of depends on who's there, what, in different years. And if they're um, qualified. Yeah, Chris Broom in the past has been a tech inspector. And Hans will be coming out to help with that again this year. Sorry to forget you. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. Oh, okay. But they're Sorry, not bringing a bike. <laughs> they're just not bringing their bike. Oh, okay. I'm glad. Cool. I'm glad we brought that up. <laughs> nice. Sorry. Nice. Hans and Ellen. Yeah. Usually they are racing. So um, that's nice. They'll be able to help. Very, them. very good. Great. All right, let's let's uh, let's jump forward then. We've kind of talked about the past and how this all fits together. Let's talk specifically about what's coming up next month. Um what do you guys hope to see happen this year? What do, What are your expectations in general for Battle Mountain this year? Well, we feel like we set the table. And then, um, so we're hoping that that we can provide all the stuff that we need to do, just the basics and that the weather cooperates and the wind is low. And the rest of it really uh, um, is up to the riders and the teams and and to give them the best opportunity they can to go as fast as they can. It's kind of what we're trying to do every year. Um, 
you know, there's there's some new challenges this year uh, with with COVID, and we're we're scaling back some of the mass participation stuff that we do. Um, so, uh, just trying to keep everybody safe um, from that too. Yeah. You know, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, yeah, we're we're we we usually have some pretty large group events that we decided this year we would just not have. Um, we will bring them back in the future, but um, because this is our this is our first time back since 2019, um, so we just want to make sure that you know people are traveling from all over the world, um, exposing themselves up all over the place. Um, so we just want to make sure everybody can be as safe as they can be. Um, and then the other thing this year is that this potentially a, a new world record could be set in women's. Um, single rider and in uh, uh, the men's tandem record could go go up, and also uh, the men's arm record could go up. So there's potential for those records. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see at, at least one of those broken, if not all of them. Um, so that'll be cool. You know, if you're, I hope you're in town for those. Uh, we can't tell you when they'll do it. Uh, people have asked in the past, what day are world records set? <laughs> so you haven't been able to schedule your world record runs. No, Is that not possible like yet? Thursday, so. right. yeah, well, there's something maybe for the future. <laughs> you can think about how, you know, you might be able to do that. that well, there's great. one person that was being pretty relentless about wanting me to pin the tail on the donkey. And I finally said, Thursday. It's Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there'll be a um, there'll be a lot of interesting development this year with the um, the collegiate bikes. Um, the I'm not exactly sure how much they've changed. I know they put a lot of energy into it. and They've had a lot of time to prepare. So um, not really. I mean, there was a whole year that they nobody well, could even get. They, yeah, they couldn't even they work couldn't together even, for a year. So yeah, they can be. So we'll see. Together. But um, it's going to be a good show. Right. There was a team from Australia that I actually talked to their um, their um, the professor that was in charge that were hoping to come and they're hoping to come next year. There just was no way with COVID. Well, you know about uh, those guys um, being able to put it all together and come. Um, yeah. Out of Sydney, I think. Uh, I've got the name of the college. A, a great effort there, Macquarie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yes. And they, they've been doing a lot of development. Um, uh participating in their local events and and uh, looks like a great project um, this year. And this is a recent development. Um, Larry Lem's junior rider didn't work out. So he's, he's bringing Adam Hari from Australia to ride Wahoo. So that's, that's a new change. And, and we're glad to see Adam come out um, again. Uh, another great athlete gifted builder. We wish he could bring his bike out. He needs support. Um, I was hoping that, um, by having this event in one spot every year and generating all these records, the, the, the teams would be able to get more support and, and the university teams do real well. Um, they put a, a super amount of energy into it too. And, uh, uh, but they have resources that the individual they, or small teams don't have, right? They, they do. They do. And we still, you know, we recognize we're a Cinderella sport. Not everyone's heard of us. Um, but uh, uh, we're just we're going to do our best to keep this uh, event happening at the same time in the same place, and hope the word finally gets out. Absolutely. All right. Um, all right. Let's get to what it is you want to say to the folks that are going to participate uh, this year in Battle <laughs> Mountain as the co-directors. Uh, perhaps most of them are watching at some time or another before the event actually takes place. You have the stage. Al, Alice, what are you saying to the folks that are about to race next month? Well, my my what I always tell them is to go fast, stay safe, and have fun. And every year I tell them to do that. Um, and then I also tell them the first night, uh, we have a mandatory meeting for all the teams so that they can uh, get all the information they need, get get uh, signed up for racing if they haven't done it yet, and uh, tell them that while they think they're there to set world records, they're actually there, and it will be a really good event if I don't have to yell at them because I don't want to yell at them. <laughs> <laughs> but we will if we have to. It's, it's a it's a big family, and and often we feel like our role is more parental. Don't um, make me mom you. And, <laughs> and um, 
everybody knows everybody else there and and i think that um well no we have newcomers well and we welcome by them. the end of the week yeah. we're all pretty bonded yeah. you know and and uh um it's unusual for a competition that um you have this kind of feeling of and and see this kind of mutual support um, where teams are helping each other with parts or labor or uh or advice and and uh um and it's special and, and it's unusual and uh and we're trying to hang on to that as we grow. So we don't want to lose that part. So yeah, they, they all become part of the family. And uh it, it you know, we every every not every time we have a wrap up meeting after we've been out racing, first thing we ask is is there anybody new in the room? So that they can be introduced and, and everybody says hello and, and welcome. And you know, it, so that we all get to know each other. It's uh, not anonymous. You don't get to to come and be anonymous. We're gonna we're going to make sure that everybody knows who you are. <laughs> so get ready for that. <laughs> yeah, get ready for that. And if there's anyone thinking about racing at uh, Battle Mountain in future years, uh, that sounds like a, a really fun, uh, encouraging uh, kind of, uh, what well, it's a nourishing atmosphere for those that want to build and learn, isn't it? Absolutely. 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 Even if they're not participating, even if you just come out to see it and you're thinking about doing it, um, do so. You get to meet everybody. Um, from the beginners to the world record holders, and and uh, um, it's just a super experience. It's uh, you know, and being out in Battle Mountain, um, I think the environment kind of lends to that. It's uh, pretty extreme. It can be um, so even out there. You know, you might have to give someone some water or uh, loan them a coat. Um, <laughs> shoes shoes all of those things have been forgotten in the past <laughs> okay noted I, I i might need to just remember that that's right so Definitely okay yes. yeah okay great advice folks uh, there you go for the participants uh you'll, you'll get a lot of help from these two right here but do not make al and alice furrow their brows. Okay, that was, yes. I guess, the lesson there. All right, and uh, then pretty much lastly on this, uh, what about spectators, uh, people that are coming, people that might think about coming, like me? Uh, what is there to see for spectators? Do you encourage them? How about making spectators into volunteers? What What is that all about? What do you think? It happens <laughs> regularly. Yeah, um, <laughs> if you're not careful, we'll hand you a radio and send you somewhere to do something. Um, yeah, we uh, we often recruit um, from the people that show up to help us out there because we're shorthanded, um, and we've gotten our, some of our best volunteers that way. Uh, we for spectators at uh, uh, Paula uh, at tourism uh, actually bought grandstands. We have this gorgeous set of tow behind your truck grandstands that unfolds like some sort of magic uh, that have an awning over the top, and they're right on the finish line. And spectators now that we, we we also got a little road pulled in there so people can actually drive up and and park next to the bleachers. And um, we don't let them out until the, the racing's over or the road is, is open, but um, they can now park there, sit in the bleachers and watch them hit the fastest speed at the finish line. And um, it's really improved the number of people that can go out and actually enjoy the event. Um, so that was a big deal when, when uh, Paula did that for, for the event. And, uh, you know, we encourage spectators to come to catch. Um, they have to stay, you know, back a ways so that they're not in our way, but catch can be fun and uh, they can bring chairs and sit down by the fence and watch what goes on. Um, we don't really encourage spectators at the start. Um, the, the teams are very focused and you don't want to get, you don't want way. to interrupt their flow. You don't want to get in the way. They're not as friendly there. It's yeah. more like a party at finish. Yeah. Um, but uh, they, we have a big, another thing that we purchased for the event one year uh, with tourism was the big scoreboard, the big digital scoreboard. And so it, it'll actually flash the bike's speed as the bike goes through the yeah. traps. And then we often, often have one of our volunteers uh, at the spectator area with the grandstands with a microphone that's just talking in general about information about the bikes that are coming and some history and and uh, just uh, highlights. Um, we usually get somebody that's pretty knowledgeable about 
our history to, to do that. And Paul Gracie in the past, he was one of our past presidents for the IHPDA and um, has a great speaking voice. So he loves to do that for us and um, others too in the past, Jonathan Woolrich and, and others have done that job. And it's really important because often the, the spectators are sitting there and they don't really know a lot about what, what they're seeing. And so that gives them some good context. And the nice thing about Jonathan is that with his British accent, even if he doesn't know what he's talking about, he sounds to us like he does. It sounds lovely. He, he yes. knows what he's talking about. He does know what he's talking Jonathan about. Jonathan definitely knows what he's talking about. Oh, he about. ran this event for, for two yes. years. Yes. We're yeah. volunteers yeah. for him. Yeah, yeah when we first showed up, he was he was the one running. It's, it's the high desert, so it cools off at night. Don't forget your jacket, water, maybe a hat. Um, if you're going to be out there in the evenings watching. And shoes. Proper shoes. <laughs> Don't wear flip-flops. <laughs> there's, there's actually scorpions out there. And thorns. <laughs> All right. And uh, uh, tickets for the week-long event cost how much? Zero. <laughs> it is absolutely free. Zero dollars. <laughs> so how are you going to beat that price? You know, you, you you'd have to the pay them to make it better. You can help the cause by buying a T-shirt or a hat or a poster. We will have those available. Or join the IHPBA. Join the IHPBA. Become a member. Um, that supports the entire club, and it's thirty-five dollars a year. It's a bargain. <laughs> None of this sounds like it's expensive. So, uh, as far as supporting, no. so we we encourage no. that as well. All right, let's finish up with uh, your hopes for the future of Battle Mountain, guys. What uh, looking down the road after this year? What are your hopes? What do you see coming? And what are your hopes for Battle Mountain? Boy, golly, you know. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a permanent home is the big dream, and and work continues toward that. Um, but it's a long, long slog, and we may have to have 305 repaved um, before we actually get a, a home of our own. There was uh, they talked on our previous program about the the possible stadium. Thing. Do you want to not talk about that right now? Or I don't even know. That's been a while. So well, maybe it's still tenant. It's in the works. Um, we're afraid to talk too much about it because we might jinx the whole thing. But there is real improvement in the the direction we're going as far as having finally having a place that that will be dedicated to what we do. Um, it will be a multi use kind of a place. Oh, and then we're gonna again be looking for. Uh, donations to to build a facility. Yeah. Um, Some major sponsors, and and of course we're looking to make it as state of the art as possible, um, and as optimized for what we're doing as possible. So we got ten miles of, of brand new pavement in two thousand and nine, but it's deteriorated. It's you know it, it goes through a lot of uh, weather up there and also a lot of traffic. So we're looking again at you know potentially having to repave that road. Um, in the near future because it's getting some very good cracks in it. We go out there and patch some things up when we get there and try to get some of the bigger divots out of the road that could cause a crash. But it's, it's, you know, we can't, we can't fill every crack in that road. Um, so yeah, we, it's just getting old is all. Yeah. So we need to probably start up with the grant writing again. Absolutely. All right. So it sounds like there are plans in place and uh, you guys are, you have your eyes on the future as well. So that's really great to hear for such a, uh, a wonderful event that needs a little bit more exposure. So we're hoping uh, to help out in that regard. Any final thoughts, uh, Al, Alice? Um, no, just, you know, if you're interested in what we do, uh, come out and watch. Um, if you think you might eventually like to compete, Come out and see how it's done. Um, we've had a number of teams that just send a team for one year just to look, to observe, to see how it's done, see who's who's doing what, um, get a, get all the information that they can before they actually put together a bike and come racing. Um, if you enjoy kind of quirky sports and uh Quirky people. Quirky people. Um, we are your we are your uh, destination. Battle Mountain is it's it's actually very beautiful. It's high desert. Uh, there's not a lot out there, um, but it it grows on you. And it's one of those places that 
uh, you don't really think about as being a destination um, in particular because it's not well known or anything, but it is actually very lovely. And so uh, just coming for a couple of days, um, a lot of people just stop by for a day or two to watch. Uh, the nearest towns on either side are Elko and Wittemucca, and they're each about an hour away. So it really is out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and and it's 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 a, an, an interesting part of America. And I think that more people should go and, and experience it because it's it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come out and see you guys next month. I'm so excited to do that and see what goes on at Battle Mountain. Uh, folks, uh, you've heard from Al and Alice. Uh, again, don't forget the donation aspect of this. Uh, we're going to have the information for the IHP, IHPV IHPV Association. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we'll have the link to that. And you can contact these guys. And if you have the means, maybe make a contribution to help them with their efforts, which is a very worthy cause, as you can see by having watched this show. So I think with that, I'm going to just thank Al and Alice Krauss so much for spending some time with the Laid Back Bike Report and telling us all about Battle Mountain. Thank you, guys. Hey, thanks for having thank us on. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Well, speaking of quirky people, here's two right here. Uh, Trey, uh, I'm very excited about heading out there next weekend. Uh, what, what what are you thinking about? Oh, I'm pretty excited as well. It's going to be awesome. The last time I was actually in that area was in, I was in the military, and I didn't get a chance to explore. So I'm looking forward to it, and I'm definitely fit the definition of quirky. So. Yeah, yeah, that's why we're going. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, my pal, uh, Mike Mowat, uh, who's on the live chat and has really uh, filled in a lot of the details uh, of uh, answering questions that we've gotten on the live chat. Uh, Mike is certainly no stranger to Battle Mountain. He has raced there uh, quite a number of years. And uh, it turns out he's coming this year as well. I, I think he wasn't going to, but uh, he is now. So we look forward to seeing you, Mike. Thanks a lot again. For helping us out on today's show there and trey yeah uh, we should be having some fun we're bringing our we're bringing our drones uh, we're bringing our cameras uh you apparently will be uh hauling some hay bales around i i'm sorry i volunteered you for that but uh not no hablo uh yeah right right so uh, those hay bales are gonna have to be taken care of by someone I, else i guess so. i want to know if i can get a hat that says i was there when they broke 90. Yeah, I'll get you one for everything that you've done. So, <laughs> all right, Trey, thanks, pal. Let's uh, move along then, folks, if we can, to our next segment. Now, many of you know about uh, John Hopkins, Inner Tuba, who is a uh, gentleman who uh, lives in Scotland from the UK. He uh, rides around and has been doing so for many years on his trike, hauling a massive trailer with a tuba in it. Where he, uh, which he uses to uh, perform um, for many groups, uh, many schools uh, and uh, assisted living places in the past. And now this year he has kind of turned uh, his emphasis to uh, home concerts, really cool stuff. We're going to talk all about that. He found himself with his trike and, uh, and trailer in Cornwall. England uh, at the Ice Strikes headquarters uh, here last week where I talked to him. So, Larry, if you're ready, let's uh, listen in on this interview. Guys, we are here today with uh, John Hopkin, otherwise known as Inner Tuba, and our pal Patrick Selwood from Ice. Hello, guys. How are you today? Good. Yeah, to see you yeah great. Thank you. Yeah. It is great. You guys are ensconced uh, there in Cornwall at the Ice World Headquarters, are you not? We are. And what a privilege it is, for me, at least. You made it sound slightly more grand than it is. We are in effectively a big shed, but yes. No no worries. I will just completely cut that out, Patrick. So um, I understand that house concerts is something that you have been working on uh, for quite some time. And uh, actually, you're really getting into it now. They've been fairly successful. So let's start out with what you've been doing here the past few months with the house concerts. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, the, the very first house concert uh, occurred uh, just before the lockdown. And I was motivated to think about doing house concerts, having come back from America 
in 2019 because houses are really big there and you can get a lot of people into them. And I thought the intimacy of playing in, in performing in people's homes um, and in, incorporating that into touring into the future was a great idea. So I did the first one just before the first lockdown, and of course, then you know it, it took a hiatus. It took a took a, took a tumble for a while, and then I started doing them again in a very small way as the lockdown reemerged. All of them from my home in the very far north of Scotland, and just now is the first time that I've been able to actually get to get to tour again, to actually be on a tricycle with a trailer and, and go, you know, a route with um, uh, multi-day touring with, with concerts interspersed amongst it. I've been doing about between 25 and 50 miles a day over several days um, c- coming from the northwest of England. I started off in the northwest of England in a, in a town called Morecambe. Uh, and I came all the way down to Dorchester, which is in Dorset, very close to the south coast. Um, and that's a, around about 300 miles. Uh, and some of the days were pretty tough. I did one day with, which was certainly in excess of 50 miles, coming from a southwest city called Bristol. And then you go over what's called the Mendip Hills. And that was the longest day. But, I, you know, I was building up my fitness and it's great to be back on the track again, actually, actually, you know, doing what we love to do. You know, we don't spend time in that area and that's a serious ride without a 200 kilo trailer. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, interspersed with house concerts, but they, they've not just been in houses. I've done them in tents. I've done one in a wheel building uh, factory, a wheel building work, bicycle wheel building workshop in Bristol. Uh, I've done some under gazebos. I've done, I've played and performed with, um, with brass bands in their band practice rooms. So it's kind of house concert with added uh, repertoire and added context now as well. Yeah. Okay. And then that brings us to your latest uh, house concert, which wasn't actually in a house. Uh, Where was the latest concert, John? I, I, I was just delighted to be able to, I don't know, give something back to Ice Tracks for all the support they've given me over many years now. Since 2006 was the first time that they they uh, they sponsored me with um, with the provision of the, the Ice Mini, which I've still got. Um, and um, so it was really nice to have this. Thank you, uh, thank you. And I don't know, it was it was the biggest house concert I've done. It was done in one of the factory uh, on one of the factory floors, and the place was full. Luckily, we were able to borrow one of Ice's. Bigger televisions to put to put the uh, the visuals and the videos up on there, and I, I just had an absolute ball performing. I don't know what you guys. Thought. Yeah, it might be nice to ask Patrick about his impression. <laughs> How was the concert? Yeah, no, it was fantastic. We had a great time. Um, we were able to invite all of the uh, kind of families and kids of the people who work here to get a get a bit of a fun thing for us all to do together. We had a pizza van in the car park afterwards, so it was a bit of a lovely get together for us here. And uh, John's kind of concert and talk hybrid kind of theme yeah. um, is the it's really nice to see. It's kind of gives a kind of context to the songs and the musical pieces, and it's more poignant than I expected. It was really fantastic to see. Yeah, yeah, good. nice. So these these house concerts uh, sound wonderful, uh, John, and you've told us all about them here. Uh, and there was a, a recent video that was made uh, about uh, your travels here over the last uh, couple of months. Tell us a little about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was really, really nice to have the opportunity to have yet another video uh, produced. I mean, you've, you've done many, as we know, Gary. Thank you for a laid back white report. But this this came about as a result of some people who stayed with me through warm showers up in Thurso in the far north of Scotland. And by complete coincidence, they happened to live on the route that I was plotting to come from the northwest of England down to the south of England. And not only did they give me somewhere to stay that night, but they also provided a house concert. And they also, on top of that, joined me for 30 miles of riding that day and took the video footage as we were traveling along. And within a day and a half or less, Marcus um, had had edited it all and completed it, and it went online. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to share it with you um, now for your viewers, because it, it, it absolutely encapsulates everything that there is about inner tube of touring and inner tube of performing in a, in a vignette. The background music is me playing the tuba, and the piece was written for inner tuba 
by an old friend of mine, Gary Lewis, and he's playing the piano on this um, uh, uh, music, which is called Intrepid Tribe. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Look at that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So this is the house that my mum and dad built. <laughs> uh, going back to 1963. <laughs> Guys, that was that was great. That video really showed us what you do, uh, John, at these uh, at these house concerts. And you have been able to raise a few funds for this upcoming tour that we are going to talk about in the USA. Tell us about the uh, the fundraising part of the house concerts. Yeah, the, the, the deal at the moment is that um, I'm asking for a sort of retiring donation from audiences at my house concerts to fund uh, the remaining parts of the, of the uh, forthcoming Mississippi River Tour, which we're hoping is going to proceed uh, next year in 23. Um, and, and, um, and audiences have been very generous in their attention to what I'm doing, but also in putting money into the, into the hat uh, at the end of the concerts. And we're getting, we've made substantial inroads into the last piece of fundraising that needs to be done to secure my um, my tour next year. And the bit that we're looking at now is the daily living cost for me to be able to be in America for around about six months or 180 days. And we're, we're factoring in now, we've put the, put the money side of that, the daily expense allowance from $30 a day to $40 a day because we've got global inflation. And I think that things are likely to cost more. But the money that's being raised now is in addition to that which has already been pledged by um, Ice Tribes, <laughs> uh, number one, um, Connecticut Yankee Peddler, the lovely retailer in Charity, Iowa, and TerraCycle, uh, Pat France over in um, over in Portland, Oregon, who's not not only making a financial contribution to the tour but also is building a new trailer. But we'll perhaps come on to that in a bit. Many of our viewers will remember that you were here a few years ago on the tour through Iowa, across Iowa, part of Ride yeah. Drive, which we helped yeah. to cover, which was wonderful. And now uh, you're going to be touring. Uh, along the Mississippi River, but let's let's take one step back before we talk about some of those details and talk yeah. about uh, the gear uh, the gear you're going to be using the trike the the trailer. How is that coming together? Well, the absolute stalwart, the proven vehicle for this kind of touring is the Ice Adventure HD 20 inch wheels all round, um, sturdy drum brakes on the front. Um, it's got plenty of braking power, immensely comfortable, strong enough to do the thing. And um, and then the trailer which I'll be using will be the same chassis that I used on Ragbri, which was made in the northwest of England by my friend Colin Stones. But um, but Pat France over at TerraCycle, he's researching some very, very much lighter weight materials, and he's generously invested in, um, in building a brand new uh, box trailer body that will go on it and in fact the chassis is currently in Oregon at the moment with that uh, with, with, with him developing the, the designs and the material choices for the new much lighter weight trailer so that, that's, that's, that's going to be exciting to, to ride an ice track again with, with a substantially lighter trailer this time over in America uh, and one of the benefits of coming down to, to, to ice trikes and meeting everybody again in person, it's lovely to see everybody again. 
know, they're such a such a nice, welcoming bunch and full of expertise. Is that we've we've, we've been able to sort of share ideas as to as to what differences we might make in the in 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 the, in the trike and the setup for the Mississippi River tour. And um, you know, there's a, there's a number of options that they're that they're open to uh, considering, and that's really exciting. Good, good. All right. So let's finish up with the uh, funds uh, uh, aspect of this. So let's say that you have raised uh, enough to make the trip uh, through uh, your your home concerts and through your donations. Um, what's the next step? Uh, what do you need to do to get over here? Well, I, I, after we've established that, that I've got enough money to uh, cover the, all of the costs of getting there and health insurance and daily living and so on and so forth, I apply for a, a visa to come to America and have permission to stay there for um, more than 90 days. If, you, if you're going to be in the country for more than 90 days, you need a visa. And one of the questions they ask is how are you going to support yourself? How are you not? How are you going to prevent yourself from becoming vagrant in somewhere like Dubuque or Baton Rouge or Nashville or whatever. So, so that would be the first thing. Any money that's left over after that uh, will be um, going into uh, blinging a ride up or accessorizing. Uh, and there's always, you know, what, while, whilst what I've got is, is kind of adequate, there's always more that I can, that I can buy. Well, let's uh, delineate some of this bling. What are you after? What, what else do you think you might need? Well, I think that the, the sun is incredibly powerfully strong. And if it were possible to have some sort of a sunshade that, that goes onto the onto the recumbent trike, I, I, you know, we've all seen those. But I need to have one which is strong enough and non-flappable enough to be able to withstand being ridden down hills at speeds sometimes very fast. Sometimes, yeah. So it, some, something yeah. like a canopy, uh, you're yeah. saying. Yeah. And, uh, and 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 John, of course, you are unflappable. So only the canopy would need to be unflappable to match uh, your yeah. flappableness, uh, <laughs> whatever that word is. Yeah. I mean, if, it, if it's going to sort of whack, whack about all over the place and and and. It, 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 you know, really become dangerous and, 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 and untether itself at speeds of over 25 or 30, 35 miles an hour, then then it's really not going to work terribly. Well. It won't work. Sure. All right. Uh, what else? Um, solar PV. Um, I was looking into the combination of Dynamo hubs and solar PV, but um, in conversation with quite a few people who have, who have experimented with these sorts of things on, on, on world tours and so on, the advice seems to be coming back that solar PV on its own is likely to work well, partly because I've got a big surface area on, on the flat of the trailer that I can adorn with, with lightweight laminate plastic um, monocrystalline solar PV and batteries are, the technology is coming on as well. And with that, I'll be able to power um, the other toys that I will want to buy, which is things like sat nav. I've also got all of the, all of the um, I want to do an outdoor show which will involve um, charging up speakers and uh, having a bit of amplification for that, um, and road lights and, and um, you know, mobile phones and uh, Garmin's and all of the things that you need in order to stay in touch with people and stay safe. And so, so you know, many is the time that I will be able to charge indoors because I think the hospitality is once again in America going to be very high but there will be times when I'm away and I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I don't have access to mains power um, and I'll need to I'll need to be using solar PV for that so that's you know th those, those are the sorts of things that I'm looking into at the moment but that I'm, I'm only going to be starting approaching companies and saying can you help with that when it's absolutely in the bag that I'm going because that's at the point where they can say, I can say, can I borrow one of these? Would it be useful for you if I took one of these on, you know, th these rather elaborate battery power packs and things like that? The time to ask people to, to help with that is when we know that we're going. All so, right. Yeah. At the, at the moment, it's the, it's the funding for the main tour itself. Okay, John. So let's see if we can get it in the bag. If, if people want to help you get it in the bag, uh, what's the way to do this? Um, what are you going to be doing and what can you ask of our audience uh, to help you uh, achieve this goal? Okay. Well, the, the, the first thing is that people can generate and can donate in cash if they're lucky enough to be able to come to a house concert by, by being proximate. But we've also got two online donation um, streams. Um, which are, can be found at 
um, innertuba.org.uk forward slash donate forward slash, simple to find. And on there, you'll see two um, um, giving campaigns, one in US dollars, which the money goes directly into a US bank account. So we avoid the need for going through what are quite punishing exchange rates at the moment between pound and dollar. Yeah. And the second one is for people in the UK or from any currency. There's a PayPal donate for mostly for people in the UK who want to donate pound sterling. So if you're stateside and you're feeling generous and you're feeling that you want to make this thing happen, we need about another two and a half thousand dollars. Uh, I think it's achievable with a combination of, of generosity um, online and people coming to house concerts. And, and I think you, you, we know definitely that the Give Butter campaign, which is the US dollar one, is definitely working, having been a bit um, sleepy for a while. Because you put in $5 yesterday, didn't you, Gary, just to check that the whole thing I was- did, and I checked my investment this morning. It has not gone up, John, as you had <laughs> promised, but uh, I'm going to stick with it in any case. So, Yeah. So that, that's that's the way that's, you get things along. Once I'm actually on the road, once I've, I'm there, the whole thing turns around, and I won't be asking for money for myself. I will be asking for donations, and those donations will be to go towards helping uh, children and young people with special needs um, right the way up the length of the Mississippi River. So I'll, I'll, I'll come into contact inevitably with all sorts of, initiatives which are, I don't know, an elementary school wanting to put in a sensory playground or a cycling initiative wanting to get children with special needs onto onto a bike project or some kind of thing which is going to enable music therapists to 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 work with uh, uh, children with learning disabilities, that kind of thing. But it's going to be little grassroots projects all the way up the, all, all the, way up the river rather than one big uh, funding campaign for one major um, organisation. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And that's super the way that you support other causes as well on your journey. Uh, John, uh, lastly, uh, I don't know that we have touched on the timeline here. So when do you anticipate you will be, able, if everything goes well, when do you anticipate leaving? And you said six months here in the States, but when yeah. do you anticipate? Yeah, I, I anticipate the first pedal stroke, which will be um, in Boothville, Venice, which is the southernmost bit of road. Um, on the on, on in the wetlands south of New Orleans by about 65 miles. I'm going to start from there. Um, probably the last week of March, first week of April, and then follow the spring as far as possible. I mean, I'm not going to be able to follow the spring all the way because 150 days, 160, 170 days later, I'll be at the Mississippi headwaters, which is at Lake Itasca, um, and Bemidji is the nearest um, major town to there. Um, Minnesota, yes? Yeah, in Minnesota. It's just quite quite close to the Canadian border there. And the route that I'm taking will be adventure cycling routes, yeah, largely, with detours into the major cities. Um, Super. And, yeah, so, that, so that's kind of... That's that sounds kind of, great. And we'll keep everyone posted uh, next year when you're here. And uh, maybe you'll get some folks to ride along with you. I, I'm guessing that would be something you'd be interested in. As well. I, 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 I hope so. Yeah, that would be wonderful. And if we've got the lighter weight trailer, um, they might not be so bored because my average speed might go up to, I don't know, even seven miles an hour. Who, who yeah. knows? It could yeah. be speeds like that. <laughs> yeah, that's why you have flames on the back. Uh, painted, yeah. So, yeah. Clearly so. There's a gentleman sitting next to you that uh, has nearly fallen asleep. Patrick, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions uh, from uh, ICE's uh, uh, viewpoint. Uh, John talked about the many years of support that you have uh, given him in his uh, quest to educate kids and, uh, and, and show them about triking and about music and, and, and everything that John does. Why has ICE supported John uh, through these years? I think big part of it is John's approach and his attitude and his kind of values align very well with, with us here at ICE. You know, he's passionate about what he does. He makes sure that he brings joy throughout the, all the things that he does on those trips. And it, it helps us to you know, feel good about what we do and help you know, promote ICE as a brand as well. It's, it's, you know, it's not purely out of the kindness of our hearts. There's some capitalism in there as well. And we, you know, we get a lot out of John's John's trips, he introduces ice and the concept of recumbent trikes to a lot of people um, throughout a lot of areas that maybe you wouldn't would never see them. Yeah, so 
So it's kind of it's mutually beneficial, but we also you know we get a lot more with John. Mm. We have done for a long time. I mean, yeah, 2006, the first strike that John had from us. That was you know, back when I was in university. I wasn't even wasn't even working here, yeah. and I've been working here my whole working life. So yeah, we've we've been supporting John for longer than I've been a nice employee, and that's that's a long, long time. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 indicative of the sort of familial approach within the whole Wickham world. I mean, I, I prefer to use the word that that um, that ICE and others are supporting what I do rather than sponsoring. Because mm-hmm. spons- sponsoring is quite hard-nosed and it's got a commercial element to it. And whilst that, that is a factor in the way we approach each other, there's also a, a friendships here mm-hmm. as well, which, which you know, we, we, sh- we shouldn't we shouldn't deny that. And, and certainly, and certainly, Patrick, uh, what John does on that trike, pulling that trailer over all those miles, it's hard to imagine a, a better proof of uh, robustness uh, of the adventure, for sure. Uh, that that trike has held up so well over the years uh, and, uh, and others, right? Yeah, I, I think it works because I think a lot of people who, who – uh, purchase um, ice trikes are in like me in their late in their late middle age, and you know uh, I think that the engineering solutions to to all of the problems that enable uh, not 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 a really fit but an averagely fit you know beyond middle aged bloke to 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 pull a heavy trailer um, across hundreds of miles um, is is kind of it, it, it's relatable to people who are thinking about about buying one it's not as if i'm a super fit athlete and you know <laughs> i think and john john's underselling himself a little bit there I mean, when we're talking about photovoltaic and, and that kind of stuff um john doesn't run a motor on the strike he's doing that all with the power of his legs you know towing that heavy trailer through those hundreds of miles across the country and yeah that's that's charging gadgets it's not charging a motor battery so oh, yeah. so yeah john john's yeah, carrying that load with the strike and, and super low gearing and making sure to kind of do it all himself, which is incredible. It's an excellent point, Patrick, because people might think that John has a has some sort of e-assist on there. He does not. He has pedaled all those miles yeah, with those legs. E-assist, and a couple of reasons for that. The first one being that if, if, if I were to go e-assist and I was saying this was a human-powered challenge, even if it was less than 1% of the overall energy that was coming from other than my human power, then, you know, in social media and so on, it's kind of, it, it's kind of muddying the waters. It's, oh, well, he's got a battery to help him. That's one reason. And the second reason is that um, you, you, you've had people talking on this on your show before. If I'm looking towards being away from mains power for a significant amount of time, the practicalities of getting the thing recharged and the issues attached to falling out of charge um, you know, um, are more than I want to contend with. And, and I'm more than happy with the simplicity of how legs use them. You know? Well, <laughs> not, absolutely. Against electric assist at all? No, not that there's anything wrong with that, as uh, Seinfeld would say. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> e-assist is a, is a big part of what ICE does, and and they they suit so many people so well. But yes, in this case, it certainly makes sense. So, all right, uh, Patrick, maybe along those lines, if you could, uh, how about a, a short update on what is the latest? What's going on with ICE? Uh, tell me about what you are promoting these days. And are you going to be popping into uh, the CycleCon show in Dayton this year? Yeah, so we'll be we'll be at the recumbent CycleCon show. There'll be uh, a big booth there right outside the test track with lots of trikes available for test riding for everyone who comes along to the show. Um, we're going to be showing lots of our, our machines, including electric assist, our MVOLO automatic shifting system, all those kind of things. Um, and our, our kind of big news at the moment is we have – Finally, after the last couple of years, this is big news. We have good stock. We have trikes available. Yeah, if you place an order with us now, we'll ship it next week for wow. the most part. So, yeah, it's, it's really good. We've finally finally got back to that point where we've got trikes in stock and we're ready to go. So, yeah. So have, having talked ice trikes up, now folks can be assured that if they are convinced to purchase one, they can get one in a very reasonable period of time, which is yeah. always great so all right uh, terrific uh john patrick thank you so much for uh, spending a little time with us today uh do you have any final thoughts for our audience today uh yeah me first yeah um if you want to follow what i'm doing the main sort of latest news conduit is um, inner tuba on facebook that's where all the latest stuff keep following it keep liking it and and thank you 
for doing that. It all helps. And um, yeah, Gary, thanks thanks to you for all your hard work, your team over there at the Laid Back Bike Report. It really makes a huge difference to the development of Inatuba. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I'd just like to say, if you, if you do get a chance to see John in concert, even if you're not a tuba fan, I don't think of myself as a tuba fan, <laughs> I don't think many people do, but it's, it's fantastic. It's a really enjoyable show and really nice to see and something different that was really enjoyable for us here. So thanks for coming in. Yeah, I really thank you. It. <laughs> Thanks, Gary, for having me on the show. Yeah. Of course, guys. Great to see you both. Uh, Patrick, look forward to seeing you in a couple months in October. And John, uh, yeah, I'll see you next year uh, as uh, things unfold with uh, Inner Tuba. Absolutely. Yeah. Take All care. right, guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Sooner than you might think, because there is John Hodkin along with his pal, Alan. And uh, John, you have... Uh, you have already moved along from uh, Cornwall. Uh, you have uh, headed up country. Tell us where you are. I'm in a, in a place called Dursley, which is uh, in between a southwest, fairly major south southwest city called Bristol, and a, a slightly smaller one called Gloucester. Um, and the two little Cotswolds towns, Dursley and Wooden Under Edge, places full of crazy names around here. And I'm in Alan's house in Dursley. Hi, everyone. Hello, Alan, and uh, and so you are you're in the process of uh, kind of heading back up into Scotland. Then is that is that yeah, your direction? I'm taking, I'm taking the track and trailer back to Morecambe, which is in the northwest of England. It's about another 250 miles from here, and I'm looking for house concert opportunities on the way, uh, of course. And um, and I'm here. St I'm spending a couple of three days here with Alan. Um, we met when I did the, the journey from the northernmost point of mainland Britain to the southernmost point of mainland Britain um, back in 2016. And at that point, Alan was putting on this um, this brass festival for young people. And maybe you can say explain a bit about why you're sitting there, Alan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, John and I met through music, which is amazing. I'm loving this uh, show, by the way. Congratulations with everything. And uh, I'm a musician. I'm not a cyclist, but... Uh, I was, I was, I'm already mindful of the, the, the obvious fellowship that you guys have got with each other, and it's similar uh, with musicians. So, so John and I are musicians together. We met. So, as John said, we were doing in 2016 uh, a brass festival in this area, and you found out about us online, yeah, and, yeah. and just got in contact. And, and it just so happened that the timing of it was perfect as John was passing through this area, was when we were holding the Brass Festival. And it was uh, a festival we were using uh, expert um, brass uh, people playing wonderful things and right down to going into schools and, um, and doing uh, workshops for uh, children to introduce them to brass. And then sure enough, John arrives in the area with his uh, cycle and uh, tuba, and uh, it's got an obvious wow factor uh so i grabbed the opportunity of, of uh using you but afraid we visited <laughs> what like eight nine schools yeah, maybe yeah. within the week and um yeah the children absolutely loved it i didn't really have to do anything with the schools i just uh, introduced john john often rode into the the um actual assembly hall of the school and did your thing and uh, it was brilliant, and our friendship started then, which was what six years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and here we are now. Yeah, yeah. No, there's there's no question. Uh, who makes who makes a, a grander entrance than uh, than John Hodgkin, right? I mean, like he steals the show right from the beginning. And uh, yeah, I, I'm a big fan, as he knows, and especially with what he's done with children. So it's great uh, to see uh, someone who has seen that from the beginning. And uh, yeah, go ahead, John. The other thing to say is Alan's a top flight full time professional. You know, he, he plays with Welsh National Opera and he teaches at the Royal Welsh um, School of Music and Drama, you know, um, postgraduate students and all that. So he's, he's Billy Wiz and w works full time. But he's also incredibly impressive because he puts an awful lot of his time into community music for which he doesn't get paid. And there's not many like that. You know, it's, um, it's, it's good. That's, yeah, it's wonderful to to see someone who cares so much that uh, that the money part of it is not uh, so important. 
Yeah. So, but at least you have a house. You were able to put John up. So you, <laughs> you must be doing all right to, to some yeah. extent. But all right, let's finish up real quickly, guys. Uh, John, I did get a, a couple of comments and questions. If we'll run through these real quickly, uh, let me put this up. So, John, uh, James Hart, uh, not sure if you can read it. Uh, he's asking about your trike. You did explain quite extensively about what's going on with the trailer. Uh, yeah. and the trike and he's suggesting uh the trailer kit from white uh a canadian company he's very happy with his uh, do you know anything about that uh, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about that but i also know that any of the hit all, all of the commercial trailers the hitch point is either at the hub or or you know if they're designed for bicycles on the seat post um and the side hitch for the amount of weight that i'm carrying just simply doesn't work and what we've done is we've found two things that combine to make the if you put the hitch post right top dead center above the rear hub that means that the the weight is biased onto the back wheel which means that you have fewer traction problems because you you've got some weight on onto the top of it um, and they're never really going to be commercially available because the fixing points for um, for the kind of racks that can support that would have to be different for each and every rear triangle. Um, so, so you know, it has to be a bespoke made thing. And after years of iteration of trying different sorts of trailers and and and, and having issues with them breaking and fracturing and so on, we've we've, we've come up with the model that works. And now we're fine tuning it into making it lighter weight and of higher quality. So commercial ones just don't cut it for just purely for that reason, because of the limitation of hitch points and the one that we found works. All right. That makes sense. Mike Smith asks, um, that tuba looked like a B flat. I played one in junior high and high school. It can produce wonderfully deep and soulful sound. So he's a fan of the B flat. Is it a B flat? It's, it's not a B flat. It's a fifth higher than that. It's an E flat tuba. Um, it's kind of the industry standard, would you say, in the UK? Um, you know, if you if, if if people have got one tuba that they're going to use for orchestral work and for jazz and for brass bands and so on, typically we over here in the UK use E flat tubas. Um, That's right. Yeah, yeah. it's a, a catch all, isn't it? You can do anything with it. Yeah. The, the B flat uh, tubas. I, I don't know if they're exactly the same in the states, but over here would be enormous. Uh, in fact, you could probably sleep in it. <laughs> so not massively practical uh, with your ring. Yeah, 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 and if John doesn't find a lot of places that will welcome him when he's here in the states, he may have to sleep in it. So it's something <laughs> to, to consider. So, yeah. and uh, lastly, here uh, I, I, we talked about this briefly, but it, 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 this does bear emphasizing. Uh, Bill McBride, do you welcome tag along riders along the way? So if everything works out well, John, and you make it to the states and you're going up the Mississippi uh, River um, routes. Do you welcome having some uh, trike riders uh, to, to accompany you? Uh, yes. Uh, and, th and this gives rise to another point. And before I say that, Bill McBride, thanks very much for the video that you sent of the north of Scotland. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but that arrived this morning. I got that. Um, uh, the route is absolutely meticulously planned. It has to be. Um, so if if you were an elementary school or a brass band or a community band that wanted me to play and you were 10 miles away from the route, the answer is no, because cumulatively, the amount of miles that that would add up would mean that it'd be unviable for me to do the route. So the route is the adventure cycling routes, um, um, as published with the, you know, the maps from the Adventure Cycling Association. With a detour, I'm going up the Natchez Trace up to Nashville and then I'll find my way back. And if people want to join me, that's where they're going to join me. And the reason that it has to be rigid is, first of all, because if I'm going to do shows and I'm going to do radio presentations and so on and so forth, as I did before when I was in America, I've got to have time to do it, um, which means that the mileage has to be specific. And the other thing is that if I'm taking a direct route, which is known to within a few miles now, I can, I can um, uh, you know, uh, take invitations from people. If you want me to do a house concert somewhere along that route, get in touch now. If you want to join me, you'll know nearer the time. If you want to join me riding, you'll know nearer the time. But I'm not going to be able to say I can come to your house, which is five miles off the route, to come and have lunch because I can't. I've got to stick to it. Right. I think his point was actually, can people just ride along with you if oh, they yeah. understand? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and I think you're all good with that, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Love, love it. But what tends to happen, and Rag Ride was a, a, a case in point with this, that I'm just literally, I'm going half the speed of everybody else. Yeah. or less 
and then you get to a hill and they can't stay, you know. <laughs> so yeah, if it's a bike, they can't stay upright. So go on a recovery ride with me all day, then that's fine. And while I pant and puff up the hills. <laughs> Sounds great. I think we're gonna probably have to leave it there. Uh John, yeah. Alan, a pleasure to have met you and mm -hmm. appreciate you coming on. And uh John, of course, we will be in touch. Good luck with the house concerts and such, and uh, we will see you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, okay. yeah. We'll see you guys. All right. Thanks. Bye -bye. All right, folks, let's uh, move along to the uh, in the uh, uh, HP Velotechnic uh, video about their new uh, speed machine. It's a speed machine uh, e pedelec they call it because it's e-assisted. Uh, kind of interesting stuff. So here is Heiko Truffle from Germany talking to us all about it. Hello and welcome to HP Velotechnic. My name is Heiko Truppe and today I want to present you the Speed Machine s Pedelec, our newest bike for the season 2023. The Speed Machine s Pedelec is based on our fast recumbent road bike speed machine and it already has speed in its name but now it goes even faster with a powerful motor with up to 1000 watts which uh, provides assistance up to 28 miles per hour. This means we have a bike ideal for commuting, but as well uh, to offer fun and speed at the weekends on tours. There's a whole variety of purposes where you can use this bike. High speeds like this demand a safe, always safe and stable ride. That's why we place the battery in the bottom for a low center of gravity um, this bike always comes with full suspension uh, to uh, get a good road hold and of course it has um, some standard features which otherwise would be optional like a mirror, a kickstand, uh, in Germany a lighting system which is optional in, in the US. We need a rear rack for the license plate so this is also standard and of course you can choose from our other options this bike, for instance, is equipped with a lowrider, so the bike can hold up to four large panniers. This bike is also equipped with fenders. And of course, you can choose from different seats. In this case, we have a bottling seat with an airflow cover. You may also choose seats of our Ergamash series, Ergamash and Ergamash Premium. And this bike is equipped with a 30-speed derailleur gearing. You may alternatively choose also the 12-speed pinion internal gear transmission. So this bike now stands for speed. I can promise you it's a lot of fun. I've been riding it. Uh, the recumbent position is ideal for electric assistance because the aerodynamic position um, allows for good range and um, we made tests and the speed machine as per leg goes up to 28 miles in just more than eight seconds so um, you should really try it's a lot of fun it's a lot of speed and you're always safe on the road the streamlined bike is available from fall and um, starts at a price of $9,070. As I said, very richly, very lavishly equipped. Another novelty which I cannot show here um, because it's so new is a new electric assist system of the STEP series. From this fall, we will offer the STEPS EP801 Cargo. We chose the Cargo version for uh, maximum power from the first pedal stroke. It comes with the automatic QSDI2 um, 10 speed gearing, a 10 speed derailleur gearing. This means that we have a system which combines strong acceleration with a smart gearing system. The QSDI2 derailleur gearing offers two new technologies, the auto shift and free shift technology. This means that um, the system can shift without pedaling which is um, revolutionary for a derailleur gearing. The system realizes when you brake and shifts automatically to a lower gear. Um, this has up to now only been seen in hub gearing. 
The EP801 Cargo is replacing the former EP8 steps motor. It's a powerful system. We chose the Cargo version because it offers full power from the first pedal stroke, which is ideal for a recumbent. As you know, the first meters are the hardest and together with the automatic shifting, it's a I don't care about nothing but have full power system. The EP801 Cargo is also available with a roll-off internal gear hub. You can program the STEPS EP801 Cargo system with different motor profiles. Uh, this means you have different profiles for different areas of use or um, different riders on the bike. As before, you can also opt for a bigger battery or even a double battery system. So if you are ready for 85 newton meters of power, the system is available for a Gecko and Scorpion trike series from fall 2022 at a price starting from 3,360 US dollars. The last novelty for the recumbent season 2023 combines two things which you already know. Our hands-on cycle now comes with a turn indicator. In my opinion, um, the turn indicator is uh, most reasonable on the hand bike because it's almost impossible to pedal and steer and show in the direction. So with a turn indicator, you're always on the safe side. It will be available from fall 2022 at a price of 760 US dollars. That's it for now. Have fun and safe rides and uh, see you next time. Bye. My buddy Heiko, thank you so much for sending that in. Uh, really nice to see a, a recumbent bike, uh, something new happening in uh, on a two-wheel recumbent uh, for a change. Always happy to have that on the show. All right, let's move along now to uh, a really interesting interview that uh, our Larry Seidman did with uh, Paul Kilgore. And uh, he is a disabled veteran, and he was involved in this really interesting event that Larry's going to talk about uh, with him right now. Thanks, Gary. Uh, for this month's sports report, we're going to feature Paul Gil Kilgore. I, I met Paul at the Wichita, Kansas Adaptive Cycling Omnium in 2021. We became friends on Facebook. And I saw he was coming to Crested Butte, Colorado for the Adaptive Mountain Bike World Championships. This was put on by an organization in Crested Butte called the Adaptive Sports Center. They do a lot of uh, skiing with adaptive needs people. And also in the summertime, they switch over to mountain biking. So this uh, event was three days of riding. The first day was practice, and then there was two days of racing, adding up to six days total, or six races total. Hey, Paul, thanks for joining us. Hey, Larry, thanks for having me. Why don't you go ahead and say prior to the days of racing, you went through a camp. Why don't you talk about the camp a little bit? Yeah, so I'm a member of the Paralyzed Veterans of America racing team. Um, I ride, obviously ride a recumbent trike, and we have members that ride uh, – both uh, trikes, recumbent trikes and hand cycles. Um, so leading up to the camp, uh, PVA always has an annual high performance off-road camp to get us ready and get us used to the altitude and training. Um, this is the first year that I've been able to attend this uh, camp. I just got uh, my off-road trike earlier this year. So that, that was a good thing. So um, I arrived uh, to Crescent Butte on the 13th of August, uh, which was a Saturday, and we uh, kind of hung out and everything. Uh, me and four other individuals, uh, two support riders and two other racers were staying in uh, a house in Crestia Butte that's owned by Adaptive Sports Center. And it's an accessible house, so guys and gals in chairs can uh, get around in both levels of the house and everything. So Sunday after we got done with dinner and everything, uh, I kind of heard this heard this weird noise. I didn't know exactly what it was. Kind of sounded like somebody was banging or beating or a popping and cracking. I just 
couldn't really process what it was. I finally got tired of hearing that noise. I was going to go investigate what it was. And just as I was coming out of my room into the living quarters, Mike Brooks was coming out of the garage yelling, active fire, active fire. So me being a volunteer firefighter that I am back home here, I ran towards the fire to see what was going on. And when I did that, I yelled, fire, fire, fire. There was a fire in the garage. Um, went back inside to make sure everybody was getting out. One of the guys came out of the shower, was like standing there with a towel, not quite understand what was going on. And I'm like, hey, get out. There's a fire. Um, Jody was in his chair. I seen him rolling down the ramp, so I knew he was gone. So we didn't have to worry about him. I went to look for a fire extinguisher. Another guy, Thomas, he grabbed a fire extinguisher behind the front door and went in and started spraying. So I went upstairs to the kitchen looking for one. I couldn't find one readily available. So I ran back downstairs, started to make sure everybody was getting out of the house. As a volunteer firefighter, I keep a fire extinguisher in my car. So I, I grabbed this 20 pound fire extinguisher out of the back of my car and went to the side door of the garage and tried to spray um, back in towards where the fire was the best I could. You know, I was in shorts and a t-shirt and flip flops and not the best uh, gear to be fighting a fire. So I, I sprayed and kind of went back, went back in a little bit lower and sprayed again and then did the best I could to try to slow the fire down. Helped Mike knock on these doors and make sure everybody was out of their, those apartments. And then got, went back out to the street, called 911 again to find out um, where the fire department was. It's been, you know, five or 10 minutes or whatever it was. It, it, it probably wasn't that long, but it seemed like a long time when you're sitting there seeing a garage on fire with, you know, a couple hand cycles and some recumbent trikes and some upright bikes in there that are more than likely burning to the ground. So it's, well, it was, it wasn't a, a great way to end our, our fun day of riding. So um, all, all, all the equipment was lost. It was a total loss. They were able to contain the fire to just basically the garage area, a little bit of involvement with the deck above and then um, some up into the elevator shaft and then a little bit in, into the, the structure itself, mostly cosmetic and some smoke. And so uh, it could have been a lot worse. An hour, hour later, we all would have been asleep and nobody may have, may not have heard it until like the smoke alarm started going off. So we, we were very fortunate on that aspect that we were all still awake, but it really, really sucks to lose uh, all that equipment. So I, I had a, a, a five month old, a Zub TIE Fly X. that was my off-road trike that I've been modifying and, Change it over to tubeless setup, and I had it dialed in, ready to race and ride, and just uh, wasn't wasn't meant to be, I guess. So you lost a trike. How many trikes do you think were lost so or destroyed? I I lost my trike. My Tie Fly X was uh, destroyed. Uh, Mike Brooks had a HP Velotechnic uh, full suspension Scorpion that he lost. Um, Jody lost his uh, lasher, and then there was two uh, upright bikes that were just the riders and sport riders and the racers over there. But Adaptive Sports Center had a whole bunch of bikes and hand cycles and trikes. I don't know all what they had, kind of strategically stacked in the corner there. And they said this, a lot of those were like a bunch of one-off trikes and hand cycles and stuff. So the the value of, uh, of equipment that was lost was probably – well, excess of a hundred thousand, just in, wow. in in equipment. So you you and Mike were able to borrow trikes from the Adaptive Sports Center, but not everybody decided to stay. A few people left before the races because of the fire. Yeah, so both those support riders uh, and a hand cyclist left the next day. So uh, they 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 left. I that was my initial instinct too, just to leave. I had another event after this to do out in the Moab area. So uh, after talking to my wife, she's like, no, you need to stay. You've been training for this event for a long time. It's so you've been looking forward to it. You've been trying to go to it for a couple of years now. You finally got a off-road trike and they got some equipment you can ride. Just make the best of it. So my wife talked me into staying. I think Mike helped as well because he wanted to stay because he didn't know if he'd ever get a chance to get back out that far and, and attend a race again. So me and Mike both stayed. Uh, luckily, Adaptive Sports Center was great. They they took care of all of our needs. Um, they set us up on a couple of uh, adapt reactive adaptive uh, stinger 
uh, recumbent trikes we were able to use. So we they got us with some SPD pedals because me and Mike both used to you know clip being clipped in and we borrowed some tools and I, I bought a couple little things just so I could have in case something happened and something did happen, you know, something happened to me and Mike on both days. So how, how would you describe the different uh, categories of the racers? So there's a, uh, there's uh, adaptive riders on uh, traditional mountain bikes, upright bikes. Um, there was a uh, hand cyclist, both powered, um, e-assist hand cyclist and uh, non-assisted. And then same with uh, the recumbents. There was e-assisted e and non-e-assisted. But I think everybody in the recumbent class, every just rode non-assisted. And then it's also broken down by men and women's categories as well. So they got quite a diverse category of race categories for the championships, which is pretty nice. Saturday, there was four stages. Um, so they kind of transport us up to the top. We kind of get situated. Everybody warms up and gets ready. And the first stage was a, a short track loop. And I, their definition is short. And my definition is short. is two different things. So <laughs> a little bit longer than a, a short lap. And uh, this was a, 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 ro a trail called Painter Boy. So it was a pretty good track. Uh, we started on a, like a fire road, like a two-lane road or a one lane road, a gravel road. And we were kind of raced down that into this first uh, hairpin turn. And that's kind of where things went awry because we did not pre-ride that course. We're like, oh, we were on Painter Boy earlier, but we didn't actually ride that loop. Um, hindsight being 2020, we probably should have. So we kind of understand better about uh, what we were getting into because we had the four of us that were racing in the recumbent category we come screaming into that first hairpin corner that's more than a 90-degree corner back the other way on the single track from a gravel road. Uh, that was kind of high adventure when the course marshal was telling us, you know, which way to go. So we got on the brakes and turned, and we're all in the wrong gear. So we started shifting and going along, and then we caught up with the hand cyclist that was hung up on some rocks there, and we were trying to figure out how to get around him. Mike actually got off and helped him push him a little bit. To let him get going and the two riders behind me and Mike kind of went around and got ahead so at that point in time I uh stepped on the gas and changed some gears and got around and was trying to catch those guys ahead of me and I dropped my chain off um this loaner trike I was on on the front uh chain ring so I stopped fixed that started going it hopped off on the rear cassette there's a single in the front and a single in the back it was all internal uh it was like an Alfine uh, internal cassette that I was that was on that trike, which is a great product. I, I really enjoyed riding that. That was a a really uh, humbling experience to be sitting on this course in the middle of nowhere with a loner trike with a broken chain in two places and nothing to fix it with because I had zero tools with me because you know obviously I lost all my tools that were on my trike and in my toolbox in the fire, my pump and everything. So I had nothing. Okay. So, so what was stage two then? So stage two, uh, I got, I got a chain. Um, they got a chain off another trike. They ran, ran down to the shop, got a chain off another trike, brought it up. We've got to put it on just a chandler and got going. And I come riding up cause you had to ride transition stages from one stage to the next stage. And that was all part of your, it's not time, but you have to be there before the next race start. And so they were just getting ready to start the, the hand cycle category behind us when I pulled up. And they're like, all right, you're ready? I said, yep. All right. I got Paul in five, four, three, two, one. And away I went. And that was a, a climb. It's called Awakening to Painter Boy. And it was a pretty, pretty good loop. And it went back and forth across the trail, uh, like the, one of the ski slopes. And quite a, quite a good climb. Um, mostly single track, um, back and forth. And I don't know how, the distance that I'd have to look at my Garmin, but it was a pretty good climb. So they started us at two minute intervals on that. So I was the last to go. I was the last of the four recumbents. And so I, I'm starting it at the back and I caught the first guy and I passed him the first recumbent ahead of me. So I knew I had gained two minutes and then I caught the second guy and those guys, you know, all my teammates, they were lucky, nice enough to kind of pull over, 
knowing that I was trying to make up some time from the bad spurt stage one I had. Okay, so then stage three, How? just a brief description, kind of keep moving on. Yeah, so stage three was, uh, it's called a trail called West Side. So we had a transition across the mountain over to West Side. And West Side's a very technical um, downhill or uphill, depending on the rate we race it both ways. Um, so it's a very technical, rocky, ruddy um, drop off. Um, there are a lot of routes. Uh, you you saw it. It's it's pretty pretty challenging course in both directions. And then so you race down that single track, and then you get on a fire road and race back to the top, and that's when your time starts. And it's only less than a mile loop, but it's probably the toughest mile loop I've ever done. Okay, and then the last stage of Saturday, what was yeah, that like? Last, last stage of Saturday was uh, we had to traverse over to the top of Red Lady Chairlift. And then we raced down a downhill called Hot Dogger. And we didn't do the whole thing, but pretty pretty far. And it's a fun single track downhill um, with berms and corners and everything. And it, it's challenging. You got, you got to be on your game. And um, I had a full face helmet with me, but I didn't um, bring it to transfer over there. So I, I made up that on the next day. I made sure I brought my full face so I could – push it a little bit further on the, on the downhill section. So that's the last thing you want to do is you're on, I'm on a trike that I'm not familiar with. I've only had a few hours riding. I'm on a course that I'm only ridden a few times. So that's part of it too. And then I got a half helmet on. So I'm kind of, I probably wasn't pushing it as much as I probably could have or, sh or should have. Okay. And then we moved to Sunday. I wasn't there Saturday, but I was able to come on Sunday, the and they had me be a course marshal on Sunday. So the first race, if I remember correctly, on Sunday was a uphill climb, yeah. and there was a one tricky spot that they put me at to kind of help people if they needed a little push to get over this this little climb. But I don't think you came through there. Ex ex explain how. Different people did a different thing that first part on Sunday. Yeah, so Sunday is you're climbing up Upper West Side, that technical trail with the rocks and all the um, roots and everything. And it it is a little bit less than a half mile, I would say. And it's probably, the like I said, the toughest half mile I've ever – going down is really tough. Coming up is twice as tough. And uh, you just got to pick your line. Um, you got to make sure you know where you're putting both, you know, your front tires, your wheels, where they're going. So you can weave through these rocks and the roots and the, get squeezed between the trees. Um, that was a difficulty. The first time I went down there, my bars weren't adjusted in far enough. So I had to make an adjustment on the bars so I could squeeze through some of the trees. I mean, there's this one spot where there's a boulder that's probably two or three feet high on the, your left as you're climbing. And then there's a tree that's been cut off. It's got a stump on the right. And you just have enough room for your front wheels, your trike to squeeze through there. And you're hung, getting hung up on the rocks and the roots behind you. So you got to kind of weave your way through there. And God forbid if it's rained and been a little bit moist like it had been this week, um, you get hung up on, on the wetness as well. So it was that was by far the hardest thing I've ever ridden in my life. I've only been riding an adaptive trike since 2019, but it's that was a it was a smoker for sure. And then they wrapped up on Sunday with a pretty fun downhill. And I've got a couple of video clips from that we'll show. Uh, yeah, describe was, the downhill a little bit. Yeah, that was the frequency downhill. So I, luckily, I I had my, my tail rider. So uh, Adaptive Sports Center does a great job of putting on this event and they give us a designated trail rider for each adaptive athlete. So we have somebody that will ride along with us. So if you flip or you need traction on the climb, like on the Upper West Side or something, they're there to help you and assist you. They can call out what's coming up around the next corner. So you're prepared because they know we don't know these trails as well as we as they do, you know, so they let, Hey, there's that big bridge. The bridge is coming next or there's that big rock stay to the right or whatever. And the tail rider, my tail rider was Tony. He was awesome. Did a great job and, you know, supported me a hundred percent. And so he had been carrying my full face. So I switched my helmet. So I got my full face helmet on now and I'm able to go a little bit faster to try to hopefully make up some time. 
um, on this last downhill, which was frequency. And that was probably the, the funnest trail on the whole mountain. I just really enjoyed um, ripping down that thing. It was, it was lots of fun. You guys look like you're having fun coming down. It's a good, it's yeah. a good way to wrap up six stages with that fun downhill at the last stage. Sure. All right. So, so we'll move on just to uh, show the results. So first place in the, do you call it the leg powered non E assist recumbent trike division? Yep. I'm not sure how you say it, but first yeah. place was Bruce Kuka, Kukar. Is that how you say his name? Kukar. And, okay. And second place was you. Yep. Third place was Dennis Parango. Parangal. And and do you say Mike got fourth place or not? Mike, Mike yeah. Brooks from Virginia got injured late Saturday night and didn't finish up. Yeah, Sunday. so – a little bit about Mike. What happened to him? He's he's the other adaptive rider that uh, lost his uh, trike in the fire, so that that's bad enough. And then um, he gets set up on the a loaner trike just like I did, which was amazing. And we really appreciate Adaptive Sports Center being able to have some equipment we can ride and continue our race, you know, training for the race and in our races. So uh, <laughs> Saturday during the race on Hot Dogger coming down. Mike gets a flat tire and Mike's like, it's just the back. I'll be fine. I can just keep going. But they made him stop and change his tire. So he had to change the tire and he had a flat tire. So he worked through that. Lucky he had a spare tube. Um, me and him scavenged some tools and bought a couple things so we could continue for the weekend. And then, uh, so he, that didn't help him in the standings at all. And then Sunday morning, he's warming up before we left the, our lodging and we're down in the basement and getting trikes ready together and, you know, getting ready to load the trucks and stuff like that. And then uh, Mike is stretching and he's like doing some knee to his shoulder stretch thing, laying on the ground or his bed or whatever. And he hears this horrible pop. And then all of a sudden he's in instant pain and he pulled a chunk of his bone off his femur from his muscle onto his knee. And so he was done. So w would you say uh, they're mostly – what manufacturers in, in uh, trikes are there? It's like road trikes, you know. There, there's so many different ones out there. I, I've ridden a bunch of different um, trikes before I decided um, on my Azub Tifly X. I wanted something that was a little bit taller so I could clear so many obstacles. I wanted something that I could switch over to a tubeless setup to be more like a traditional mountain bike try to alleviate, alleviate some flats and stuff. And I like the idea of having a full suspension. Uh, the leaf springs on the front of the, the TIE Fly X do a great job in the front and then the air shock in the back. Um, it was For me, it was a great trike. It's just, it just personal preference. Um, the Stinger I rode with the handlebars kind of sideways, I really kind of like that. It's a comfortable riding position versus, you know, traditional hands up type of thing. So it just... They're all a little bit different. Bruce okay. Cooker, the guy that got first place, he was on a Sunseeker with 20-inch, 4-inch wide, full-fat type tires. And I don't know what, what model that trike is. I know he has an E-Assist on it, but he didn't run that over the weekend. And then so he you know, he was racing that trike and obviously beat me on my loaner trike. So hats off to him. He did a good job. I think if I would have been on my – my personal trike that I brought out there that I traveled with that I didn't travel home with, it might've been a different story. <laughs> well, one last question, because you guys are riding in single track, which is basically for two wheel upright mountain bikes, but you guys are on three wheel trikes. How does that work? If the, uh, the single track is this wide, but your trike is a little wider than the single track. Yeah, there, there's a couple times you got you got to be paying attention because you, it's not like when you're riding a traditional mountain bike, you know, you can just kind of flow your way through. You know, uh, being a previous mountain bike uh, rider and racer way back in the day myself, uh, I know how it is to ride on single track, and it's totally different on a trike because you're not just picking one line for your tires and wheels to go through. You're picking three, so you got left and right and and your rear, you know, and then like with the hand cycles, it's the same thing. Say the guys on a lasher that are spinning. They got their front tire that they steer with, but then they got their two trail tires behind their seat that they have to worry about. So you really got to pick uh, 
a line through there, especially on those mountain trails. A lot of them are off camber, so you're at an angle, and so you're going across a, what's normally a ski area in the winter, and you're on a single track, so you're deciding, okay, I got to put my left wheel or right wheel, whichever way you're going, left or right across the mountain, traversing. You got to kind of think in your mind, where do I need to put both my front tires so I don't have a tendency to flip, and you're leaning one way, putting your tires somewhere else, and you're still pedaling and trying to pick your line through the single track. So it's it's pretty challenging, even when you're just going slow, let alone add that you're racing against the clock, trying to get your best time to get across that stuff as well. So it's it definitely adds a totally different dynamic to um, even like gravel racing where you're on a, a flat or wider gravel trail or road or definitely versus the road. And I've done all of the above. So it's it's definitely it's fun. It's adventurous. You just got to be able to know you know how to pick your line and you get to something that's a little bit wider. It, you may have to get off and reposition or you move or put a foot down or a hand down to keep yourself from flipping over and you will flip over. Good. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. So is this a, an annual event at Crested Butte? It, it is an annual event. Yep. And they're always looking for more, more uh, recumbent riders and uh, upright riders and hand cyclists to come out and compete in the event. I know they have a cap of how many racers they allow in. I, I don't know what that number is, 25 or 30, something, something like that. Hey, Just, hey. From a support wise, they can only have so many people that they can. And and, and you don't have to be part of the veterans group, the PVA. Not that word, no, there's you know okay. people that are non veterans out there as well. Obviously, PVA sends a pretty good contingency from our team out there every year. And I was glad to be able to be selected to come out there this year to to race, and hopefully, I'll be allowed to come back next year, and maybe I'll have a, a new track by then. All right. Well, well. Thank you so much for your time, and we'll we'll try to keep keep it on the event calendar. And maybe we'll get some more people out there next year. Thanks so much. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, Larry. Wow, what a story! Thanks, Larry and Paul. Uh, we hope to get uh, Paul and maybe uh, PVA out uh, to uh, CycleCon this year with a booth that uh, you guys can find out more about them. I will have all those links in the description below so all right uh, let's move along here the uh viewer submissions we don't have any this month if you have something you want to share uh on the laid back bike report laid back bike report at gmail.com let us know we'll put something together for you and now on to our incredible sponsors first of all there is TerraCycle. From fairings to headrests, whatever accessory you need, Pat and crew have you covered. And trailside trikes. If you find yourself in Florida, near the Withlacoochee Trail, or in Knoxville, Tennessee, check out Andrew's shop and amazing crew. And Terra Trike and Green Speed Trikes. Your vision, whatever it is, Terra Trike has a trike to take you there. And green speed cutting edge designs create performance through Aussie ingenuity and laid back cycles, the top USA dealer for Terra Trike and the premier source for Cat Trike, Ice, and Green Speed. We give you the freedom to ride. And Connecticut Yankee Peddler. We feature multiple brands of trikes, including electric assist models. Test rides and Southern Iowa hospitality are always available at our mega store in Cheriton. And Avenue Trikes. With the gearing you need and the comfort you want, it's time to enjoy riding again. They're in stock, ready to ship, and only $19.95. Dealer inquiries are welcome. And Azub. In addition to the titanium suspension, another technological gem brought to you by Azub is an optional folding mechanism. It's not only easy to operate, but works great and looks fantastic. And Recumbent PDX, Cat Trikes West Coast Megastore. Schedule your test ride on trikes with pedal assist electric from both Bosch and Bafang, roll off and schlump component groups and adaptive builds. Experience the joy of Cat Trike and EcoCycles. 
Adding eAssist to your bank can be a daunting task. With total focus on customer service, the experts at EcoCycles makes this upgrade simple and worry-free. Check out EcoCycles today. All right, guys, let me just finish up uh, with a couple of announcements, the major one being CycleCon. We've been dancing all around it and talking about it the last few months. Uh, of course, we got Battle Mountain first, and then we get back in a couple weeks later. We're off to Dayton, Ohio for CycleCon, newly purchased by the Whiz Wheels group uh, from, uh, from Chuck. Um, and uh, so they have made a few changes. One of the most important one you need to know about is the website. So uh, Trey was telling me a little bit earlier that he tried the old recumbent cycle con search on Google and website, and it wasn't directly leading you to the new website. The new website is cycle-con.com. So cycle-con.com. Com. So uh, you'll find lots of information there about what's going on uh, newly there. Uh, Trey, pop up those. Uh, yeah, pop up those slides so folks can actually see what is written as I tell you a little bit about what I know. So uh, it is uh, October 7th through 9th. Now, the 7th is dealer day only. So dealers from all over the, well, the, the world will be coming to uh, talk to manufacturers. Now, the 8th and 9th, Saturday and Sunday, are open to the public. So that's when you guys can uh, hope to come in and uh, and and see a number of things. Uh, celebrity speakers, uh, we've got seminars there. Uh, Marshall asked me uh, from Whiz Wheels to see if I could help out uh, bringing some people to the seminars I'm working on that now. We've got lots of exciting speakers lined up, so you will enjoy that part. And then, of course, all the booths from the manufacturers are there. New products, all your favorite manufacturers should be there. You can go and talk to them, ask questions. Um, head out on the test track, of course, and try some stuff out. It's just a great opportunity for people to see a lot of things in one place. So uh, CycleCon is wonderful. So we'll be there, of course, uh, doing our comprehensive coverage uh, Trey and I will be uh, doing interviews with all the manufacturers and some of the people that are there, some of the dealers. Um, we'll have a booth and you can come and ask questions of our, some of our team members that are at the booth. So uh, come and say hi. I might be running around a lot doing interviews, but if you see me, please uh, don't hesitate to say hi. I'd like to talk to all of our viewers uh, when we have a chance to do so in person. All right. Uh, the next show uh, is going to be right after CycleCon. So uh, October 16th is a date, 2 p.m. Eastern time. We will have a, uh, a summary review of what we've seen for all of our uh, panelists who have attended CycleCon. So we'll talk about what we saw. And of course, uh, a few weeks later, I will have edited all the uh, video that we shot there and we'll have our huge uh, extravaganza CycleCon video that we put out every year that CycleCon goes. So we, uh, we're excited to bring that to you as well, as well as this uh, Battle Mountain video that uh, Trey, or, uh, Trey and I are going to put together for you. So uh, that's all in the pipeline. So um, be uh, be looking out for that. All right. How can you support the Laid Back Bike Report? If you appreciate what we're doing, there's a few ways you can do so. You can like us on Facebook. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. And you can click that little wide eye right there. Take That will take you to the laidbackbikereport.com website where you can find out lots more information, past shows, what's coming up. Uh, you can find out how you can become a Patreon supporter like all of these folks right here. Uh, you can do so for as little a, as a dollar a month, and we sure do appreciate that support from our Patreons. All right, guys, let's uh, there's our bring our skeleton crew up here. So this show may be a record breaker, guys. Now, uh, folks, uh, it ran a little long, uh, mm -hmm. and and that's saying something for the laid back mock report. Uh, these guys right here and myself, we were we, we were young men when this show started at two <laughs> o'clock. So I'm not I'm saying still young. Are you okay? Well, Trey's got a secret that he'll have to reveal to us after the show. Guys, thanks a lot for working so hard. Uh, Larry, thanks for that uh, great interview you, you did with Paul. All very much appreciated. And Trey, my pleasure. Yeah, we'll, thanks. And uh, Trey, yeah, we'll be uh, we'll be getting together in person ourselves here very shortly. And uh, yep, we're and leaving for too much longer. Yeah, heading out west. So, all right. So, thanks to my crew members there, and of course, thanks to all of you for uh, watching. 
today and and every month uh, when we put on the Laidback Bike Report. So until our next webcast from all of us here at the Laidback Bike Report, so long, bent riders. <laughs>